Stone of Tears by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 137. Kalin sighed in relief. Richard nodded his thanks. Kalin knew he didn't look forward to meeting the ancestors' spirits again. The last time had been devastating to him. Suddenly, there was a flutter of shadow in the air. Kalin threw her hands up protectively. Richard was knocked back a step as something hit him on the head. People shouted in confusion. A dark shape thumped to the ground between Richard and the birdman. Richard straightened, putting his fingers to his scalp. Blood trickled down his forehead. The birdman squatted down over a dark form and then straightened. He was holding a dead owl cradled in his hands. The head lolled to the side. The wings fell open. The elders all looked at one another. Chandelin's frown deepened, but he said nothing. Richard inspected the blood on his fingers. Why in the world would an owl hit me like that? And what killed it? The birdman gently smoothed the dead bird's feathers. Birds live in the air, a different level than us. They live in two levels, land and air. They can travel between their level and ours. Birds are closely connected to the spirit world, to the spirits. Owls more than most birds. They see in the night where we are blind, and just as we are blind to the spirit world, I am a spirit guide for our people. Only a birdman can be a spirit guide because he can understand such things. He held the dead bird a little higher. This is a warning. I have never witnessed an owl bringing a spirit message before. This bird gave its life to warn you. Richard, please reconsider your request for a gathering. This warning means the gathering will be dangerous. Dangerous enough for the spirits to send this message. Richard looked from the birdman's face to the owl. He reached out and stroked its feathers. No one made a sound. Dangerous for me or for the elders? For you. You are the one calling for the gathering. The owl brought the message to you. The warning was for you. He glanced up at Richard's forehead. A blood warning, one of the worst kinds. The only thing worse than an owl would have been if a raven had brought the message. That would have meant sure death. Richard took his hand back and wiped his fingers on his shirt. He stared down at the dead owl. I don't have any choice, he whispered. If I don't do something, the veil will be torn and the keeper of the dead will escape. Our people, everyone, will be swallowed into the world of the dead. I must learn how to stop it. I must try. The birdman nodded. As you wish. It will take three days to prepare. Richard looked up. You did it in two days before. We can't spare any time. The elder took a deep breath and sighed. Two days. Thank you, honored elder. Richard turned to her. His eyes were filled with pain. Kalen, please find Nissel and bring her. I'm going to the spirit house. Ask her to bring something stronger. She squeezed his arm. Of course, I'll hurry. Richard nodded. He pulled his sword from the ground and walked off into the darkness. Chapter 13 Cause of Death She looked up and thought, pressed the round end of the plain, wooden-handled pen to her lower lip. The small, modest room was dimly lit with candles set among and on top of the disheveled piles of paper on her desk. Scrolls were balanced precariously in stacks between fat books. The dark patina of the desktop was only visible in a small area in front of her, framing the waiting report. Odd objects of magic stood jammed together collecting dust on the shelves behind her. The ever-present and diligent cleaning staff was not allowed to touch them, and so the task of dusting them was left to her, but there was never enough time or inclination. Besides, they looked less important to curious eyes when covered in a mask of dust. Heavy drapes were drawn against the night. The only splash of color in the room was one of the local blue and yellow carpets she had placed on the other side of the desk. Visitors usually spent their time in her office staring down at it. Cause of death. Reports were such a bother, she sighed, but a necessary bother, for now anyway. The Palace of the Prophets required reams of reports. There were sisters who spent their whole lives in the libraries, cataloging reports, pampering them, keeping records of every useless word they thought might someday be important. 
Well, there was nothing for it but to think up a suitable cause of death. The truth would never do. Her sisters would have to have a satisfactory explanation as to the cause of death. They valued highly those with the gift. Fools. Training accident? She smiled. Yes, a training accident. She hadn't used that one in many years. She pursed her lips as she dipped the pen in the ink bottle and began writing. The cause of death was a training accident with the Radha Han. A twig, as I have often warned the other sisters, no matter how young and tender, will break if bent too far. Who could question? Let them wonder where among them the fault lay. It would keep them from digging too deeply, lest the blame fall on them. As she blotted the paper, there was a soft rap at the door. One moment, please. She touched the corner of the boy's letter to the candle flame, and when it was nearly consumed, tossed it in the cold hearth. The broken seal melted into a molten red puddle. He would be writing no more letters. Come. The heavy round-topped door opened enough to admit a head. Sister, it's me, came a whisper from the shadow. Don't stand there like a novice. Come in and close the door. The woman entered, closing the door quietly after putting her head back out to check the hall. She didn't look down at the carpet. Sister, with a finger across lips and an angry scowl, she was silenced. No names when we are alone. I've told you before. The other looked about at the walls, as if expecting someone to pop out. But surely you've shielded your room. Of course it's shielded. But it is always possible the breeze could carry words to the right ears. If that ever happened, we wouldn't want our names carried with the words, now would we? The other's eyes flicked around at the walls again. Of course not. Of course you are right. She scrubbed her hands together. Someday this won't be necessary. I hate that we must remain hidden. Someday we will be able to... What have you found out? She watched as the woman straightened her dress at the hips and then put her fingers to the desk, leaning over a little. Her eyes had a fierce intensity. They were strange eyes, pale, pale blue with dark violet flecks. She always found it hard not to stare at those eyes. She leaned closer and whispered, They found him. You saw the book? She nodded slowly. I saw it. At dinner time, I waited until the others were at dinner. She gave an even look. He refused the first offer. She slapped her hand down on the desk. What? Are you sure? That's what the book said. And not only that, there was more. He's grown. Grown into a man. Grown? She took a heavy breath as she watched the sister standing before her. Which sister was it? What difference does it make? They are all ours. No, they weren't. I wasn't able to send three of our own, only two. One is a sister of the light. The other's eyes widened. How could you let that happen? Something as important as this. She slapped her hand down on the desk again. Silence. The other straightened knitting her fingers together. A small pout came to her face. It was Sister Grace. She closed her eyes and leaned back in the chair. Sister Grace was one of ours, she whispered. The other leaned over the desk again. Then only one of the two remaining is ours. Who is it, Sister Elizabeth or Sister Verna? That is not for you to know. Why not? I hate never knowing. I hate not knowing if the sister I'm talking to is a sister of the light or one of us. A sister of the dark. She slammed her fist on the desk and gritted her teeth. Don't you ever say that out loud again, she hissed, or I will send you to the nameless one in pieces. This time the other stared down at the carpet as her face paled. Forgive me, she whispered. There isn't a sister of the light alive who believes we are anything but myth. If that name ever reaches their ears, they could begin to wonder. That name is never, ever to be spoken aloud by you. If the sisters were to ever discover you, or who you serve, they would have a Radahan around your neck before you had a chance to scream. The other's hands went to her throat as she let out a small gasp. But I, you would claw your own eyes out for fear of seeing them come to question you every day. That is why you are not to know the names of the others. So you can't give them over. That is why they don't know your name, so they can't give you over. It is to protect us all so we may serve. The only name you know is mine. But, sister, 
I would bite my own tongue off before I ever gave them your name. You say that now, but were there a rod of harn around your neck, you would be begging to give me up just to have it off. And it isn't my forgiveness that matters. If you fail us, the nameless one will not be forgiving. When you meet his eyes, it will make whatever could be done to you with the rod of harn while you are alive seem a pleasant time at tea. But I serve. I am sworn. I have given the oath. Those who serve well will be rewarded when the nameless one is free of the veil. Those who fail him or fight him will have an eternity to regret their mistake. Of course, sister. She was staring furiously at the carpet now. I live only to serve. She knitted her fingers back together. I will not fail our master. On my oath. On your soul. Her defiant violet-flecked eyes came up. I have given my oath. She nodded as she sank back in the chair. As have we all, sister, as have we all. She stared at the other's eyes a moment. Did the book say anything else? I didn't have time to search it thoroughly, but there were some other things I caught. He is with the mother confessor. He is promised as her mate. She frowned. The mother confessor. She waved her hand. That is no problem. What else? He is the seeker. She slapped her hand on the desk. Curse the light. She let out a noisy breath. The seeker. Well, we can deal with that. Anything more? The other nodded slowly, leaning closer. He is strong and grown, yet only two days after he triggered the gift, the headaches made him unconscious. She rose slowly out of her chair. This time it was her eyes that went wide. Two days, she whispered. Are you sure? Two days? The other shrugged. I'm only telling you what the book said. I'm sure of what it said. I'm not sure it is true. I don't see how it could be. She sank back into her chair. Two days. She stared at her desk. The sooner we get a Radha Han around his neck, the better. Even the Sisters of Light would agree with you about that. There was a message sent back from the prelate. She lifted an eyebrow. The prelate herself sent orders? The other nodded. Yes. Under her breath, she added, I wish I knew if she was with us or against us. She ignored the comment. What did she say? That if he refuses the third offer, Sister Verna is to kill him herself. Have you ever heard of such an order? If he is really this strong and he refuses the third time, he would be dead in a few weeks anyway. Why would she give such an order? Have you ever heard of anyone refusing the first offer? Well, no, I guess I haven't. It is one of the rules. If one with the gift refuses all three offers, they are to be killed, to spare them the suffering at the end, the madness. You have never seen such an order before, because you have never heard of anyone refusing the first offer. I have spent time in the archives, looking through the prophecies. That is where I saw the reference to the rule. The prelate knows all the obscure rules, the old rules, and she is afraid. She has read the prophecies, too. Afraid? she asked, wide-eyed. The prelate? I have never seen her afraid of anything. She nodded up at the woman. She is afraid now. Either way suits our purposes. Either he is collared or he is dead. If he is collared, we will deal with him in our way, as we have always done. If he is dead, we won't have to. Maybe better he were dead. Maybe better he were dead before the Sisters of the Light find out what he is, if they don't already know. The other leaned against the desk again, lowering her voice. If they know or find out, there are those among the Sisters of the Light who would kill him. She studied the violet flecks a moment. Indeed, there are. A smile spread across her face. What a dangerous dilemma for them. What a glorious opportunity for us. Her smile faded. What of the other matter? The woman straightened. Ranson and Weber are waiting where you wanted them. She folded her arms beneath her breasts. They were pretty cocky, because they have passed all the tests, and tomorrow are to be released. A sadistic grin came to her thin lips and flecked eyes. I gave them a little reminder that they still wear the collar. I'm surprised we can't hear their knees knocking together all the way up here. She ignored the other's smile. 
I have lessons to give. You will go in my place. Tell them I had reports to work on. I'll go see to our two friends. They may have passed all the prelates' tests, but they have not yet passed all of mine. One has an oath to give, and the other... She leaned halfway over the desk, hunger in her flecked eyes. Which one? Which one are you going to... Oh, I so wish I could watch or help. Promise me you will tell me everything. She smiled at the other's eagerness. Everything, I promise. From beginning to end, every last scream. Now go see to my lessons for me. The woman danced through the doorway like a giddy schoolgirl. She was too eager. That kind of eagerness was dangerous. That kind of lust made one forget to be careful, made one take chances. She pulled a knife from a drawer and made a mental note to use her less in the future and keep an eye on her. She tested the edge gingerly with a thumb and, satisfied it was razor sharp, tucked the knife up her sleeve, the sleeve without the dakra. She plucked a small, dusty statue from the shelf and slipped it into a pocket. Before she was around the desk and through the door, she remembered one more item and turned back to pick up the stout rod leaning against the side of her desk. It was late, and the halls were quiet and mostly empty. Despite the heat, she pulled her short, thin, blue cotton cloak tighter across her shoulders. Thoughts of this new one with the gift gave her a chill. Groan, a man. She shook her head as she walked silently over the long carpets, past lamps set in wall brackets, centered in the raised cherry paneling, past tables set with dried flowers, and past heavily draped windows looking out over the bailey and courtyard below. Lights of the city in the distance twinkled like a carpet of stars. Slightly rank air drifted in the windows. Must be near low tide, she thought. The cleaning staff, polishing a chair rail molding here or a banister there, dropped into deep curtsies as she swept past. She hardly noticed them, and certainly didn't acknowledge them. They were beneath her attention. Grown into a man, her face heated with anger at the thought. How could this be? Someone had made a serious mistake, a mistake, an oversight. It had to be that. A maidservant on her hands and knees, concentrating on wiping at a spot on a carpet, looked up just in time to leap back out of the way with a, Forgive me, sister. On her hands and knees, she touched her head to the floor with another apology. Groan. It would have been difficult enough to turn this one if he were still a boy, but a man? She shook her head again. Groan. She smacked the rod against her thigh in frustration. Two maidservants nearly jumped at the sound and fell to their knees, burying their tightly closed eyes behind prayerful hands. Well, grown or not, he would have a Radahan around his neck and a whole palace full of sisters to watch over him. But even wearing a Radahan, he was still grown into a man, and the seeker. He might be difficult to control, dangerously difficult. If necessary, she guessed, he could always have a training accident. If not that... There were certainly enough other dangers to one with the gift, dangers that could leave a man worse than dead. But if she could turn him or use him, that would make all the trouble worthwhile. She turned into a hall she had first thought empty, then noticed a young woman standing in the shadows between lamps, gazing out a window. She thought she recognized her, one of the novices. She stopped behind the young woman and folded her arms. The novice tapped her toe on the carpet as she leaned on her elbows through the opened window, looking at the gates below. She cleared her throat. The young woman spun, gasped, and dropped into a curtsy. Forgive me, sister. I didn't hear you coming. A good evening to you. When the big brown eyes came up, she put the end of the rod under the young woman's chin and lifted it a little more. Pasha, isn't it? Yes, sister. Pasha Mays. Novice, third rank. Next in line to be named. Next in line, she sniffed. Presumption, my dear, does not befit a sister, and less so a novice, even one of the third rank. Pasha cast her eyes down and gave a curtsy, as best she could with the rod still under her chin. Yes, sister, forgive me. What are you doing here? Just watching, sister, watching the night? Watching the night? I would say you were watching the gates. Am I wrong, novice? Pasha tried to look down, but the rod lifted her chin, keeping her eyes to her superior. No, sister, she admitted. You are not wrong. I was watching the gates. She licked her full lips several times. At last, she spilled out the words. 
I heard the talk, the talk among the girls. They say, well, they say three of the sisters have been gone a long time now, and that could only mean they are bringing back one with the gift, a new one. In all the years I have been here, I have never seen a new one brought in. She licked her lips again. Well, I am... I mean, I hope to be next in line. And if I am to be named, I will have to be assigned a new one. She knitted her fingers together. I so want to be named a sister. I have studied hard, worked hard, waited and waited, and no new one has come yet. Forgive me, sister, but I just can't help being excited and hopeful that I will be worthy. So, yes, I was watching the gate, hoping I would see him brought in. And you think you are strong enough to handle the job, to handle a new one? Yes, sister, I study and practice my forms every day. She looked down her nose at the novice. Is that so? Show me. As they stared at each other, she felt her feet rise off the ground a few inches. Solid grip of air, strong, not bad. She wondered if the novice could handle interference. With that thought, fire ignited at both ends of the hall, sweeping with a howl toward the two women. Pasha didn't flinch. The fire hit a wall of air before reaching them. Air was not the best for fire. A small error Pasha quickly corrected. Before the fire burned through, the air became moist, dripping. The fire hissed out. Although she didn't try to move, she knew she couldn't. She could feel that the grip held her firmly. She turned it cold, brittle with ice, and broke it. When she was free, she lifted Pasha from the floor. Defensive webs from the girl wove through her snaking onslaught, but failed to break the grip. Her feet rose again. Impressive. The girl could counter even while being held. Spells tangled together, conflicting, fighting, snarling into knots each matched and defended, striking back at any opportunity. The silent, motionless battle raged on for a time, the two of them hanging inches off the ground. At last she tired of the sport and severed herself from the webs, tying them to the girl, locking them on. She settled gently to the ground and left Pasha with the whole weight of the load to juggle. A simple, if devious, escape, giving the opponent not only the attacking spells to deal with, but dumping her own back on her. Pasha hadn't been expecting this and wasn't able to defend against it. It was not the way she had been taught. Sweat ran down the novice's face as she grimaced slightly. The force radiating through the hall made carpets curl up at their corners. Lamps chattered in their brackets. Pasha was getting angry. Her brow wrinkled. With a loud crack that shattered a mirror far off down the hall, she broke the spells. Her slippered feet settled to the ground. Pasha took a few deep breaths. I have not seen that done before, sister. It is not by the rules. She put the rod back under the other's chin. Rules are for children's games. You are no longer a child. When you are a full sister, you must deal with situations where there are no rules. You must be prepared for that. If you always stick to somebody's rules, you may find yourself at the point of a very sharp knife, held by a hand that doesn't know about your rules. Pasha didn't flinch. Yes, sister, thank you for showing me. She smiled inwardly, but kept it off her face. This one had a spine, if a small one. A rare commodity in a novice, even one of the third rank. She let her eyes take in Pasha again. Soft brown hair that just touched her shoulders, big brown eyes, attractive features, lips of the sort men stared at, proud upright shoulders, and a sweep of curves that even a novice's dress failed to conceal. She let the rod trail from Pasha's chin down her neck, down into the heart of her exposed cleavage. Grown into a man. And since when, Pasha? She said in a quiet voice that could have been taken for either threatening or kind. Have novices been allowed to wear their dresses unbuttoned like this? Pasha blushed furiously. Forgive me, sister. It's such a warm night. I was alone... I didn't think there was anyone about. I just wanted to let the breeze cool my skin. Her face turned a deeper red. I sweat so there. I never meant to offend anyone. I'm so embarrassed. Forgive me. Pasha's hands rushed to the buttons. With the rod, she gently pushed the hands away from the swell of the young woman's bosom. The Creator made you this way. You should not be embarrassed of what he has chosen in his wisdom to bestow upon you. You should never be ashamed, Pasha, of what he has graced you with. Only those of questionable loyalty to the Creator would scorn you for being proud of showing the Maker's hand in all its magnificence. 
Why, thank you, sister. I never looked at it quite that way. A frown wrinkled her brow. What do you mean, questionable loyalty? She pulled the rod away and lifted an eyebrow. Those who worship the nameless one don't hide in the shadows, my dear. They could be anywhere. Why, even you could be one. Even me. Pasha fell to a knee, bowing her head. Oh, please, sister, she implored. Don't say such a thing of yourself, even in jest. You are a sister of the light, and we are in the palace of the prophets, safe, I pray, from the whispers of the nameless one. Safe? With her rod, she motioned the novice up. After she was on her feet, she gave her a stern look. Only a fool assumes she is safe, even here. Sisters of the light are not fools. Even they must always be alert to the dark whispers. Yes, sister, I will remember. Remember it any time someone would make you ashamed of how the Creator has formed you. Ask yourself why they blush at seeing the Maker's hand. Blush as the nameless one would. Yes, sister, thank you, she stammered. You have given me things to think on. I have never thought about the Creator in this way before. He has reasons for the things he does. Is this not true? What do you mean? Well, when he gives a man a strong back, what does that say? Everyone knows that. He was given the strong back to use. It means the Creator has given him the strong back so that he might work to feed his family, work to make his way, work to make the Creator proud, and not waste the Creator's gift by being lazy. She whisked the rod up and down in front of Pasha. And what do you think the Creator had in mind when he gave you this body? I don't know exactly. That I should use it to make the Creator proud of his work in some way? She nodded. You think on it. You think on your reason for being here. Being here at this time. We are all here for a reason. The Sisters of the Light are here for a reason, are they not? Oh, yes, sister. We are here to teach the ones with the gift, teach them to use it, and guide them, so that they may not hear the whispers of the Nameless One, that they may hear only the Creator. And how are we able to do that? We were given the gift of being sorceresses, so that we may be able to guide them in their gift. And if the Creator was wise enough to give you that gift, the gift of being a sorceress, do you not think he may have given you your looks for a reason, too? Maybe to be a part of your calling as a sister of the light, to use your looks to serve him? Pasha stared. Why, I never thought of it that way before. In what way are my looks to be of aid? She shrugged. We cannot always know what the Creator has intended. When he wishes, it will be revealed. Yes, sister, her voice was unsure. Pasha, when you see a man that the Creator has graced with good looks, a finely shaped body, what do you think? What do you feel? Pasha blushed. I... sometimes... it makes my heart race, I guess. It makes me feel... good. Feel longings. At last, she allowed a small smile. There is no need to blush, my dear. It is a longing to touch what the Creator's hand has wrought. Don't you suppose it pleases the Creator that you appreciate his work? Don't you think he wants you to like what he has done, to enjoy it? Just as you must know that men enjoy witnessing your beauty and long to touch the work of the Creator's hand, it would be a crime against the Creator not to use in your service to him what he has given you. Pasha smiled shyly. I never thought about it in that way. You have given me new eyes, sister. The more I learn, the more it seems I don't know. I hope that someday I will be a sister of the light half as wise as you. Knowledge comes as it will, Pasha. Life's lessons come at the most surprising times, like tonight. She swished the rod toward the window. Here you are looking out a window hoping to learn one thing, and you have learned something more important. Pasha touched her arm. Oh, thank you, sister, for taking the time to teach me. No sister has spoken so frankly to me before. This is one lesson, Pasha, that is outside the palace curriculum. It is a lesson the nameless one would be angry you learned, so keep it to yourself. As you think on what I have told you, and the Creator's hand is revealed, you will understand better how it is to work for him. 
And if you need more understanding, I will always be here to help guide you. But keep our talk from the others. As I said, you can never tell who listens to the whispers of the nameless one. Pasha curtsied. I will, sister. Thank you. A novice is given many tests, tests of the palace's devising. There are rules to them. The final test to be named a sister of the light is being charged with a new one. In this, the final test, there are not always rules. New ones can be difficult to control, but that does not mean they are bad. Difficult? Of course. They come here plucked from the only life they knew and are thrust into a new place with new demands they don't understand. They can be rebellious, difficult to control. It is because they are afraid. We must have patience. Afraid? Of the sisters? And the palace? Weren't you afraid when you first came here? Just a little? Well, maybe just a little, but it was my dream to come. I wanted it more than anything. For the new ones, it is not always their dream. They are confused about their power. With you, it grew as you grew. You were accustomed to it. It was part of you. With them, it is sometimes sudden, unexpected, not what they planned or wanted. The Radahan can ignite the power, and it is new to them. It can be frightening. That fear makes them fight it sometimes. Fight us. Your job, the responsibility of a novice of the third rank, is to control them for their own good until they can be taught by the sisters. In all your other lessons, there have been rules. In this, there sometimes are no rules. The new ones don't know of our rules yet. They can be difficult to control if you follow only the rules you know. Sometimes the collar is not enough. You must use whatever the Creator has given you. You must be able to do whatever it takes to control the will of these untrained wizards. That is the true and final test to be a sister. Novices have failed in this final test and been put out of the palace. Pasha's eyes were wide. I have never heard such things. She shrugged. Then I have been of aid to you. I am pleased the Creator has chosen me to help. Perhaps others have not wanted so strongly for you to succeed and have held back. Perhaps you would do well to bring to me your questions about any new one you are assigned. Oh, yes. Thank you for your help, sister. I must admit it worries me to learn that new ones can be difficult. I guess I always imagined that they would be eager to learn and that it would be a joy to show them and to help teach them. They are all different. Some are as easy as a babe in a crib. Let us hope you are given one like that. Some will test your wits. Why, I have even seen old records that tell of ones that have triggered the gift before we could get to them, before we could get a Radahan on them and help them. No, that must be frightening for them to have the power awakened without guidance from us. Indeed. And fear can make them troublesome, as I have said. I have even seen an old report of one who refused the collar on the first offer. Pasha's fingers covered her mouth as she gasped. She took them away. But that means one of the sisters, she nodded solemnly. It is a price we are all prepared to pay. We bear a heavy responsibility. But why wouldn't the parents make him accept the offer? She leaned closer, lowering her voice. In the report I saw, the one with the gift was grown. A man. Pasha stared in wide-eyed disbelief. A man, she whispered. If a boy can be difficult to control, what if a grown man? She gave the novice an even look. We are here to serve in the Creator's work. You can never tell what the Creator has in his plan, why you are given what you have. A novice in charge of a new one must use whatever the Creator has given her. The collar is not always enough. You can never tell what you might need to do. The rules don't always work. Do you still want to be a sister of the light, even knowing you may be given a new one who could be more difficult than any other novice has ever been given? Oh, yes. Yes, sister. If the new one is difficult, I know it is a test from the Creator himself to see if I am truly worthy. I will not fail. I will do whatever must be done. I will use everything I have learned, everything the Creator has given me. I will be on guard that he may be from a strange land or have strange customs and be afraid or troublesome or difficult, and that I may have to make my own rules to succeed. She hesitated. And if you are so kind as to mean what you said about helping me, then I know I will have your wisdom backing me, and I will not fail. 
She nodded with a smile. I have given my word. It holds, no matter the difficulty. She frowned in thought. Perhaps it could be that you are graced with your looks so a new one might see the beauty of the Creator through you, through his work. Perhaps this is how you are to show a new one the way. It would be an honor in any way to show a new one the light of the Creator's hand. You are right in that, my dear. She straightened, clasping her hands. Now, I want you to go to the mistress of the novices and tell her that you have too much free time and that starting tomorrow you need to be assigned some chores. Tell her you have been spending too much of your time looking out windows. Pasha bowed her head and curtsied again. Yes, sister, she said meekly. She smiled when the novice looked up. I too have heard that three of the sisters are searching for one with the gift. I think it will be a while before they return with him, if at all, but when they return and if they bring him, I will remind the prelate that you are next in line and are ready for the task. Oh, thank you, sister, thank you. You are a fine young woman, Pasha. The Creator has truly shown the beauty of his work in you. Thank you, sister, she said without blushing. Thank the Creator. I will, sister. Sister, before the new one is brought in, could you teach me more about what the Creator has intended for me? Help me to understand? If you wish. Oh, I do, I really do. She patted Pasha's cheek. Of course, my dear, of course. She stood up straight. Now off to the mistress of the novices with you. I won't have soon-to-be sisters with nothing better to do than stare out windows. Yes, sister. Pasha curtsied with a smile and rushed off down the hall. She stopped and turned. Sister, I am afraid I don't know your name. Go. Pasha flinched. Yes, sister. She watched the swell of Pasha's hips sway as she walked quickly off down the hall, kicking the rolled edges of carpets back down as she went. A girl had exquisite ankles, grown into a man. She collected her thoughts and started off again, down the halls and stairs. As she descended, the wooden stairs changed to stone. The heat lessened, although not the stuffiness or the smell of the tide flats. The warm glow of lamps was replaced by the flickering shadows of widely spaced torches. The cowering palace staff diminished in number until she saw no one. She continued down to the lowest floors, below dusty storerooms, down below the servants' quarters and workshops. The torches became more widely spaced until there were no more. She ignited a ball of flame in her palm and held it up to see by as she continued on. When she reached the proper door, she sent the flame into a cold torch set in a bracket next to the doorway. The stone-walled room was small, an abandoned cellar of some sort, empty except for moldy straw on the floor, a lit torch, and the two wizards. The smell was unpleasant, burning pitch and damp mold. At her entrance, the two stood, swaying slightly. Both wore the plain robes befitting their high rank. Each had a stupid half-grin on his face. They weren't cocky, she realized. They had been drinking, probably celebrating their last night in the Palace of the Prophets, their last night with the Sisters of the Light, their last night wearing the Radahan. The two men had been friends since they had been brought to the palace as boys, almost at the same time. Sam Weber was a plain man of average height with curly light brown hair and a clean-shaven jaw that seemed too big for the rest of his soft face. Neville Ranson was slightly taller, with straight black hair cut short and smoothed neatly down. He wore a short, well-kept beard that was just beginning to show flecks of gray. His eyes were almost as dark as his hair. His features seemed all the more sharply formed, standing next to his soft friend. She had always thought he had grown into a handsome man. She had known him since he had come to the palace as a small boy. She had been a novice then, and he had been the one assigned to her, put in her care her final test before becoming a Sister of the Light. That had been a long time ago. Wizard Ranson swept his arm across his middle and gave a dramatic, although wobbly, bow. He came back up with a widening grin. His grin always made his face look boyish, despite his years and the beginnings of gray. A good evening to you, Sister. Hard as she could, she backhanded him across the face with her rod. She could feel his cheekbone break. He fell back to the floor with a cry. I have told you before, she hissed through gritted teeth, never to use my name when we are alone. Being drunk does not excuse the order. Wizard Weber stood stone still, his eyes wide, his face white, his grin gone. 
Ranson rolled over on the ground with his hands to his face, leaving blood on the straw. The color came back to Weber's face in a red rush. How dare you do this? We have passed all the tests. We are wizards. She sent a cord of power into the Radahan. The impact threw him back against the wall, where the collar stuck to the stone like a nail to a magnet. Passed the tests, she screamed. Passed the tests. You have not passed my tests. She twisted on the pain until Weber was choking in agony. Is this how you address a sister? Is this the way you show respect? She snipped off the cord and he fell to the floor, giving a grunt when he hit. He pushed himself up on his knees with an effort. Forgive me, sister, he said in a pained, hoarse voice. I beg you, forgive our disrespect. His eyes rose cautiously to meet her glare. It was only the drink speaking. Forgive us, please. With her fists on her hips, she stood watching him. She pointed with the rod at the one rolling and moaning on the floor. Heal him. I don't have time for this nonsense. I have come to give you both your test, not to watch him whine and complain about a little slap. Weber bent to his friend, rolling him gently over on his back. Neville, it's all right. I'll help you. Lie still. He took the man's shaking hands away and replaced them with his own. He began talking and healing. She waited impatiently with her arms folded. It didn't take long. Weber was talented at healing. Weber helped his friend sit up and, with a handful of straw, wiped the blood from the healed wound. Ranson pushed himself to his feet. His eyes flashed anger, but he kept any speck of it out of his voice. Forgive me, sister. What is it you want? Weber came up beside him. Please, sister, we have done everything the sisters have asked. We are finished. Finished? Finished? I don't think so. Have you forgotten our talks? Have you forgotten what I told you? Did you think I would forget? Simply let the two of you dance out of here, free as birds. No man walks out of here without seeing me or one of mine. There is the matter of an oath. The two glanced at each other, retreating a half step. If you will let us go, Weber offered, we will give you our oath. She watched them a moment, her voice coming quietly at last. My oath? It is not an oath to me, boys. It is an oath to the keeper. You know that. They both paled a little. And the oath comes only after one of you has passed the test. Only one of you has to give the oath. One of us? Ranson asked. He swallowed. Only one of us has to give the oath, sister? Why only one of us? Because, she whispered, the other will have no need to give an oath. He is going to die. They both gave a little gasp and moved closer together. What is this test? Weber asked. Take off your robes and we will begin. They glanced at each other. Ranson lifted his hand a little. Our robes, sister? Now? Here? She looked to each. Don't be bashful, boys. I have seen you both swim naked in the lake since you were only this big. She held her hand out just below her waist. But that was when we were boys, Weber complained. Not since we have grown into men. She glowered at them. Don't make me have to tell you again. The next time I will burn them off you. They both flinched and began pulling their robes over their heads. She made a deliberate point of looking each up and down just to show them her displeasure with their argument. Each man's face turned red in the torchlight. With the flick of her wrist, she brought her knife to her hand. Up against the wall, both of you. When they didn't move quickly enough, she used the collars to slam them against the wall. With a thin stream of power to each Radahan, she immobilized them against the stone. They were flattened against the wall and helpless to lift a finger. Please, sister, Ranson whispered, don't kill us. We'll do anything, anything. She looked over at him. Yes, you will, one of you anyway. But we haven't gotten to the oath yet. Now still your tongue or I will do it for you. As the two were held helpless, she moved to Weber first. Putting the knife tip against his upper chest, she drew it slowly down carefully cutting through the skin and no more. Sweat poured from Weber's face as he gritted his teeth. His jowls shook. After she had made a cut about a forearm long, she went back to where she had begun and made another next to it. So the two cuts were about a finger's width apart. Small, high-pitched sounds escaped from the man's throat as she drew the knife along. The ends of the parallel lines drew together to a point, 
Small trickles of blood ran down his chest. She worked the knife point under the top between the cuts, separating the skin from him until there was a generous flap of it hanging down. She moved over to Ranson and made the same twin cuts with a flap of skin hanging away at the top. Tears ran down his face with the sweat, but he said nothing. He knew better. When finished, she straightened and inspected her work. They looked the same. Good. She tucked the knife back up her sleeve. One of you two is going to have the Radahan taken off tomorrow and be free to go. As far as the Sisters of the Light are concerned, anyway. Not as far as I, or more importantly, the Keeper, are concerned. It will be the beginning of your service to him. If you serve well, you will be rewarded when he is free of the veil. If you fail in your tasks, well, you wouldn't want to know what would happen to you if you should fail him. Sister, Ransom asked in a shaky voice, why only one of us? We could both give the oath. We could both serve. Weber's sudden glare shifted to his friend. He didn't like being spoken for. He always had been obstinate. The oath is a blood oath. One of you will have to pass my test to earn the privilege of taking it. The other is going to lose the gift tonight, lose his magic. Do you know how a wizard loses the gift? They both shook their heads. When they are skinned, the magic bleeds from them. She said it as if she were discussing peeling a pear. Bleeds away until it's all gone. Weber stared at her, his face gone white. Ranson closed his dark eyes and shook. At the same time, she wrapped the flap of skin on each man around her first fingers. I'm going to ask for a volunteer. This is just a little demonstration of what is in store for the one who volunteers. I don't want either of you to think dying is going to be the easy way out. She gave them a warm smile. You have my permission to scream, boys. I believe this is going to hurt. She yanked the strips of skin off their chests. She waited patiently for the screams to stop, and even a little while longer while they sobbed. It was always good to let a lesson sink in. Please, sister, we serve the Creator as the sisters have taught us, Weber cried. We serve the Creator, not the Keeper. She regarded him coolly. Since you are so loyal to the Creator, Sam, I will give you first choice. Do you want to be the one to live or to die tonight? By him, Ransom demanded. Why does he get to choose first? Keep your tongue still, Neville. You will speak when spoken to. She slid her gaze back to Weber. She lifted his chin with a finger. Well, Sam, who dies, you or your best friend? She folded her arms across her breasts. He looked up at her with hollow eyes. His skin was ashen. He didn't look over at his friend. His voice came in a flat whisper. Me. Kill me. Let Neville live. I won't give an oath to the Keeper. I would rather die. She looked back into his empty eyes a moment and then turned to Ransom. And what have you to say, Neville? Who lives, who dies? You are your best friend in the world. Who gives the Keeper their oath? He glanced to Weber, who didn't look back. He licked his lips. His dark eyes came back to her. You heard him. He chooses to die. If he wants to die, let him. I choose to live. I will give the Keeper my oath. Your soul, he nodded slowly, his eyes flashing fierce determination. My soul. Well then, she smiled, it seems you two friends have come to an agreement. Everyone is happy. So be it. I am pleased, Neville, that it is to be you with us. You have made me proud. Do I have to be here? Ranson asked. Do I have to see it? See it? She raised an eyebrow. You have to do it. He swallowed, but the hard look stayed in his eyes. She had always known it would be him. Oh, not that there hadn't been doubts, but she had known. She had taught him well. She had spent a great deal of time on him, bending him to her way. May I be granted one request, Weber whispered. May I have the collar off before I die? So that you may make wizards life fire and take your own life before we have a chance to take it from you? Do you think I am stupid? A stupid soft woman? She shook her head. Denied. She released both Radahan from the wall. Weber sank to his knees, his head hanging. He was alone in the room and knew it. Ranson stood and straightened his shoulders. He pointed at the bloody wound down his chest. What about this? She turned her gaze to Weber. Sam, stand up. 
Weber stood, his eyes staying to the ground. Your good friend has an injury. Heal him. Without a word, Weber finally turned and put his hands on Ranson's chest and began healing. Ranson stood tall, waiting for the pain to be taken away. She walked to the door and leaned her back against it, watching Weber do his work. His last work. When he finished, he didn't look at either her or Ranson, but went to the far wall and slid his back down it until he sat on the floor. He buried his head between his knees and folded his arms around them. The healed but still naked wizard strode up to her and stopped, waiting. What is it I am to do? She flicked her wrist, bringing the knife to her hand once more. She gave it a quick, sharp toss in the air, catching it by the blade. She held the handle out to him. You are to skin him, alive. She pushed the handle against him until his hand came up and took it. Ranson's eyes left her steady gaze. He stared at the knife in his hand. Alive, he repeated. She reached into a pocket and pulled out the small item she had brought, a pewter figure of a man on one knee holding a crystal over his head. His tiny bearded face was turned up to it in wonder. The crystal was slightly elongated, coming to faceted points. Inclusions floated frozen inside like a sky of constellations. She wiped the dust off it with the corner of her light cloak and held the small statue out to Ransom. This is magic, and a receptacle of magic. The crystal is called Quillian. It will absorb the magic as it bleeds from your friend after he is skinned. When, and only when, all his magic has bled into the Quillian, it will give off an orange glow. You will bring the crystal to me to prove you have done the job. Ransom swallowed. Yes, sister. Before I leave tonight, you will give the oath. She pushed the figure with the crystal toward him until he took it. This will be your first task after giving the oath. Fail it, or fail any of the tasks to follow, and you will wish you could trade places with your friend. You will wish it for all eternity. He stood gripping the knife in one hand and the small figure in the other. Yes, sister. He stole a quick glance over his shoulder at the man crouched on the floor against the wall. He lowered his voice. Sister, could you... Could you still his tongue? I don't know if I could bear him talking while I do it. She raised an eyebrow. You have a knife, Neville. If his words bother you, cut out his tongue. He swallowed and closed his eyes for a moment. They came open. What if he dies before the magic is all bled away? With the Quillian present, he will live as long as there is any significant trace of it in him. After it's all in the crystal, it will begin to glow... In that way, you will know it is finished. After that, I don't care what you do with him. If you want, you may finish him quickly. What if he tries to prevent what I do? He leaned a little closer. With his magic. She smiled and gave a nod. That I will still with his collar. He will not be able to stop you. After he's dead, there will be no life force to hold the Radahan on him. It will open. Bring it with you and give it to me when you bring the crystal. And what about the body? She gave him a hard look. You know how to wield the subtractive. I have spent a good deal of time teaching you, as have others. She darted a glance at Weber. Use it. Get rid of the body with subtractive magic. Every last scrap of it. Every last drop of blood. Ransom straightened a little and nodded. All right. After you have finished here, and before you come to me at dawn, there is one more task you will perform this night. Ransom took a deep breath, letting it out slowly. Another task? Must I do another task this night? She smiled and patted his cheek. This second task you will enjoy. It's a reward for doing a good job with the first. Serving the Keeper well has its rewards, as you will find out. Failing him has its punishments, as I hope you never discover. He looked suspicious. And what is this second task? You know a novice named Pasha? He let out a grunt. There isn't a man in the palace who doesn't know who Pasha Nath is. And how well do these men know her? Ransom shrugged. She likes to give a kiss and a cuddle in the corner. Any more than a kiss and a cuddle? I know a few men who have had their hand up her skirt. I've heard them talk about what fine legs she has. Now they will give up the gift just to have those legs around them. 
but I don't think any have. Some of the men watch out for her, as if she were a defenseless kitten. One in particular, young Warren, keeps a watchful eye on her. Warren is one of the men she likes to kiss and cuddle? I don't think she would know him if he was standing in front of her, he chuckled softly. If he could even work up enough courage to take his nose out of the archives and look her in the face, he frowned. So, what is the task? When you are finished here, I want you to go to her room. Tell her how you are to be released tomorrow, and that when you passed all your tests, the Creator came to you in a vision. Tell her that the Creator told you in this vision that you were to go to her and teach her how to use the glorious gift of her figure that he had given her, how she was meant to use this gift to please men, so that when the special task he has for her is revealed, she will be prepared. Tell her the Creator said it was to help her deal with her new one, as he would be the most difficult any novice had ever been given. Tell her the Creator revealed to you that he made this night hot, so she would sweat between her breasts over her heart to awaken her to his wishes. She gave him a smooth smile. Then I want you to teach her how to please a man. He stared incredulously at her. What makes you think she will believe any of this or go along? Her smile widened. You tell her what I told you to tell her, Neville, and you will have a great deal more than your hand up her skirt. She will probably have her legs around you before you finish talking. He nodded dumbly. All right. She glanced deliberately down at him. I'm glad to see that you are up to the task. She looked back to his eyes. Teach her everything you can think of to please a man. At least everything you can teach her by dawn. Teach her well. I want her to know how to make a man happy and keep him coming back for more. He smiled. Yes, sister. She put the tip of the rod under his chin, lifting it a little. You be gentle with her, Neville. I don't want you to hurt her in any way. I want this to be a very pleasant experience for her. I want her to enjoy it. She looked down at him again. Well, do the best you can with what you have. I've never had any complaints, he snapped. Idiot. Women don't complain to men's faces about that. They complain to the backs of their heads. Don't you dare jump on her, please yourself, and then fall asleep. You have until dawn. I don't want you sleeping tonight. You make sure this is an experience she remembers fondly. You teach her well, everything you know. She pushed up with the rod a little more. This may be a pleasant task. But it is a task for the keeper just the same. Fail in this as in any other, and your service will end abruptly. But your pain will go on and on. Keep alert when you are with her. In the morning, I expect a detailed report of everything you have taught her. You will report every bit of it. I need to know what she knows so I may guide her. Yes, sister. She glanced past him to the man against the wall. The sooner you finish here, the sooner you can be with Pasha and the more time you will have to teach her. He nodded with a grin. Yes, sister. She took the rod away, and he let out a breath. With a gesture, she made his robe float to her hand. She shoved it at him. Put this on. You're embarrassing yourself. She watched as he began gathering the material and putting it over his head. Tomorrow the real work, the real task, begins. His head poked through the robe, his arms following one at a time. What work? What task? After you are released, you must be off at once in the service of your homeland. You do remember your homeland, don't you? You are going to go to Aidendrill as an advisor to High Prince Phiron. You have things to do there, important things. Like what? We will talk about it in the morning, but now before you can do the first task and the second, and the rest of it, you have an oath to give. Is this of your free will, Neville? She watched his eyes. They darted briefly to his friend, huddled against the wall. Then he turned to glance at the knife and the quillion. She saw his dark eyes go out of focus, and she knew he was thinking about Pasha. He answered her in a whisper. Yes, sister. She nodded. Very good, Neville. Neil, the time of the oath is upon you. As he went to his knees, she lifted her hand. The flame of the torch puffed out, plunging the room into total blackness. The oath to the keeper, she whispered, is given in the darkness 
that is his homeland. Chapter 14 Gently, Kalin pulled the door open. He was awake and sitting in front of the fire. When the door closed, it shut out some of the eerie sound of the boldas and the drums coming from the center of the village. She stood next to him and tipped his head against her leg and then combed her fingers through his hair. How is your headache? It's all right. The rest and that last drink Nissel gave me helped. He didn't look up. They want me out there, don't they? Kalen sank down to sit on the ground next to him. Yes, it is time. She rubbed his shoulder. Are you sure you want to eat the meat, knowing this time what it is? I have to. But it's still meat. Will you be able to eat it? If I want a gathering, I have to eat it. The way is the way. I will eat it. Richard, I'm worried about this gathering. I'm not so sure you should go through with it. Maybe there's another way. The Birdman is afraid for you, too. Maybe you shouldn't do it. I have to. Why? He stared into the fire. Because this is all my fault. I am responsible. It is my fault the veil is torn. That's what Shota said. My fault. I caused it. Dark and Rahl caused it. Somehow. And I am a Rahl, he whispered. Kalen glanced over, but he didn't look back. The crimes of the father passed on to the son? He smiled a small smile. I don't believe that old line, but maybe there is a little snip of truth to it. His eyes turned to her. You remember what Shota said, that only I could restore the veil? Maybe because Dark and Rawl tore it through the magic of Orden and my intervention, I have to restore it. She watched the firelight flicker in his eyes. So you think what? That maybe since a Rawl tore it, it takes a Rawl to close it? He shrugged. Maybe. That could explain why only I can close it. It may not be the reason, but it's the only one I can think of. He smiled. I'm glad I'm marrying a smart woman. She grinned. It made her happy to see him smile. Well, this smart woman can't see how that could be the reason. It might not be, but it's a possibility I have to consider. Then why do you have to go through with the gathering? His eyes lit up with the excitement as he gave her a boyish grin. Because I figured it out. I figured out what we're going to do. He rearranged himself, turning toward her and folding his legs. Tomorrow night, we'll have the gathering and find out what we can that will help us. Then, the next morning, when it's over, he snatched the dragon's tooth up in his fist and held it up to her as the grin grew on his face. Then I call Scarlet with this. That's how we get to Zed. That's how we can get to Aidendrill without the headache stopping me on a long journey by land. Scarlet flies with magic. Her magic allows her to cover vast distances in little time. We'll be gone before the sisters can stop us and it will take them a long time to follow. I won't have to turn them down for now. I can get to Zed first. He will know what to do, about the headaches, I mean. After the gathering, I'll call Scarlet. It will probably take her the better part of the day to reach us. He leaned forward and gave her a quick kiss. While we're waiting, we'll be married. Her heart leapt. Married? Yes, married. All in the same day, day after tomorrow. We'll do it all and be away before the day is out. Oh, Richard... I would like that. But let's do it now. Call Scarlet now. We can be married in the morning when she gets here. I know the mud people would do it quickly for us. We can get to Zed and he will know what to do and you won't have to risk a gathering. He shook his head. We have to have the gathering. Shota said only I could close the veil, not Zed. What if he doesn't have any idea what to do? He has said he doesn't know much about the underworld. No one does. No one knows about the world of the dead. But the ancestors' spirits do. I have to find out whatever I can to help. We can't waste the time going to Zed only to find out he doesn't know what to do. I have to find out what I can first, then go to Zed. Shota said only I could close the veil. Maybe it's because I am the seeker. I have to do my job and find the answers. Even if they mean little to me, they might be significant to Zed, and then he might know what to do, know what I can do. What if we beat Zed to Aidendrill? If we travel on Scarlet, she will get us there in a day. Zed may not be there yet. If he isn't there, we know he's going there and we'll find him. He will be able to see Scarlet. She watched him a moment. Your mind is made up about all this, isn't it? He shrugged. If anyone could poke holes in my idea, it would be you. You have any better ideas? She shook her head at last. I wish I did, but I don't. I like all of it but the gathering. Richard's face softened with a gentle smile. 
I would really like to see you in the wedding dress Wesselon is making. Can she have it done that soon? We could spend our wedding night in Aidendrill in your home. Kaylin couldn't keep the smile back. She can, and there doesn't have to be a big wedding party. Anyway, there's not time to prepare with the banquet for the gathering going on, but the Birdman will be pleased to marry us without it. She looked at him coyly. We would have a real bed in Aidendrill, a big, comfortable bed. His arm circled around her waist and pulled her against him. He gave her lips a soft kiss. She didn't want it to end, but she gently pushed back and glanced away. Richard, what about the other things Shota said about a child? Shota was wrong before about a lot of things. Even the things she was right about didn't turn out how we expected. I'm not going to give you up on her word. Remember what you said to me one time about never letting a beautiful woman pick your path for you when there was a man in her line of sight? And besides, we will be able to talk to Zed first. Confessors and the gift are something he does know a lot about. She ran her finger down his chest. You seem to have an answer for everything. How did you get so smart? He pulled her to him and kissed her again, harder this time. I will find an answer to anything that tries to keep me from you and your big comfortable bed. I would go to the underworld and fight the keeper himself to be with you. She cuddled against his shoulder. It seemed like forever since he had found her in Westland, being chased by a quad. It seemed a lifetime ago, not a mere few months. They had been through so much. She was so tired of being afraid and being chased, hunted. It wasn't fair that just when it was over, it was starting again. She gave herself a mental shake. That was the wrong way to see things. It was the problem, not the solution. She forced herself to look at the new problem in its own light and not color it with what had happened in the past. Maybe it won't be so hard this time. Maybe we can do it as you say and find out what needs to be done and be finished with it. She kissed his neck. We'd better get out of here. They are waiting. And besides, if I stay here with you any longer, we won't make it to my big comfortable bed. They left the quiet of the spirit house and walked hand in hand through the dark pathways between the buildings of the village. She felt safe holding his hand. From the first day they met, and he offered his hand to her to help her up, she had liked having her hand in his. No one had ever done that before. People were afraid of confessors. She wanted this over so they could be together and live in peace, so they could hold hands whenever they wanted and not ever have to run. The sound of the people, the dancing, the conversation and the children grew louder until the two of them passed into the firelit field. Musicians stood on open grass-roofed platforms, swaying as they drew paddles up and down the carved ripples on the boulders, sending the haunting strains out over the surrounding flat grassland. Arms a blur, men pounded on drums, sending frantic echoing beats across the village to others who answered or joined in. Dancers in costumes followed one another around in circles stopping and turning as one, jumping and stomping, acting out stories for the gleeful children and the adults who crowded around them. Cooking fires sent sweet-smelling smoke and wonderful aromas drifting to them. As they walked past, large fires roared and crackled in the center of the field, warming one side of her with their heat. Men proudly wore their finest skins and women their brightest dresses. All had their hair freshly slicked down with sticky mud. Woven trays of tava bread, roasted peppers, onions, long beans, cabbage, cucumber, and beets, bowls of stewed meats, fish, and chicken, as well as platters of boar and venison, were carried by young women from the cook fires to people gathered at various shelters. The whole village was in joyful celebration to welcome the ancestors' spirits. Savidlin stood at their approach, welcoming them onto the elders' platform. He looked dignified with his official coyote hide around his shoulders. The birdman and the other elders gave the two of them smiles and nods. As soon as she and Richard sat cross-legged, the young women brought woven trays and platters of food. They both took pieces of tava bread and rolled them around peppers, careful to put them to their mouths with the right hand only. A boy brought pottery mugs and a jug of water mildly flavored with spices. When he was satisfied they were comfortably settled, the birdman nodded to a group of women at a nearby shelter. Kalen knew what this meant. The women were special cooks, the only ones allowed to prepare the banquet specialties. Richard's eyes watched as one of them came with a woven platter filled with dried meat, neatly arranged in a circular pattern. He gave no sign of his feelings. There would be no gathering if he didn't eat this meat, 
Worse, this was not just any meat. She knew, though, that he was determined and would eat it. The woman bowed her head, holding the platter out to the bird man and then the other elders. After each took some, she offered it to the elders' wives. A few took a piece. She turned and held the platter out to Richard. He looked at it a moment and then reached up and took one of the larger pieces. He held it in his fingers, looking at it as the woman left after Kalin declined the offer. I know it is difficult for you, the bird man said to Richard, but it is necessary for you to have the knowledge of our enemies. Richard pulled off a big bite with his teeth. The way is the way. He chewed and swallowed without showing any emotion. He looked off into the distance. Who is it? The bird man watched him a moment after Richard looked back to him. It is the man you killed. I see. He took another bite. He had taken a big piece and was eating the whole thing to show them his determination to have the gathering, to show them that despite the warning from the spirits, he was resolved to go through with it. He watched the dancers as he chewed, washing each swallow down with a drink from his mug. The elders' platform was an isolated island of quiet in the sweep of noise and activity. Richard abruptly stopped chewing. His eyes widened. He sat up straighter. His head snapped around to the elders. Where's Chandelin? They looked at one another after studying his face a moment. Richard sprang to his feet. Where's Chandelin? He is here somewhere, the birdman said. Find him right now. Bring him here. The birdman sent one of the nearby hunters to search. Richard hopped down off the platform without a word and went to the shelter with the banquet cooks. He found the woman with the platter of meat and took a piece. Kalin turned to the birdman. Do you have any idea what is going on? He nodded solemnly. He has had a vision, a vision from our enemy's flesh. It happens sometimes. That is why we do this, to know what is in our enemy's hearts. Richard returned and paced back and forth in front of the elder's platform, waiting. Richard, what is it? What do you see? He stopped pacing. The expression on his face was agitated. Trouble. He resumed his pacing. She asked what sort of trouble but he didn't seem to even notice the question. At last, the hunter returned with Chandelin and his men. What would make Richard with a temper ask for me? Richard shoved the piece of meat at him. Eat this. Tell me what you see. Chandelin watched Richard's eyes as he ate the strip of dried meat. Richard went back to his impatient pacing, pulling off another bite with his teeth. He chewed and paced. Finally, he could wait no longer. Well, what do you see? Chandelin watched warily. An enemy, Richard let out an exasperated breath. Who was this man? From what people? He was Bantak, from the east. Kalin jumped up. Bantak? She hopped down off the platform and stood next to Richard. Bantak are peaceful. They would never attack anyone. It is against their way. He was a Bantak, Chandelin repeated. He had black painted on his eyes. He attacked us. He redirected his gaze to Richard. At least, that is what Richard with the temper claims. Richard went back to pacing. They're coming, he muttered. He stopped and grabbed Chandelin by the shoulders. They're coming. They're coming to attack the mud people. Chandelin frowned. The Bantak are not fighters. It is as the Mother Confessor says. They are peaceful. They plant crops, herd goats and sheep. We trade with them. This one that attacked us must have been sick in the head. The Bantak know the mud people are stronger than they. They would not attack us. Richard hardly heard the translation. Get your men together. Get more men. We have to go stop them. Chandelin studied him. We have nothing to fear from the Bantak. They would not attack us. Richard nearly exploded. Chandelin, you are charged with protecting our people. I am telling you there is a threat to them. You must not ignore me in this. He ran his fingers through his hair, calming himself. Chandelin, don't you think it a little strange that one man would have attacked all of us? Would you, as brave as you are, have come into the open and attacked that many men by yourself, you with only a spear and they with bows? Chandelin only glared. The bird man led the other elders off the platform and stood next to Chandelin, facing Richard. Tell us what our enemy has revealed to you. Tell us what you have seen. This man... Richard held the piece of meat up in front of the birdman's face. This man was the son of their spirit guide. The elders broke into worried whispers. The birdman didn't move his eyes from Richard. Are you sure of this? 
Killing the son of a spirit guide is a grave offense, even in self-defense. It would be the same if someone killed my offspring, had I one. He lifted an eyebrow. Grave enough to start a war. Richard nodded hurriedly. I know. That's what they had planned. For some reason, they thought the mud people were suddenly dangerous to them. To be sure, they sent the son of their spirit guide, knowing that if we killed him, it would be a sign of our hostile intent. They were planning on watching for his head on a pole to see if they were right. If he didn't return and they found the head, they were going to attack. He waved the meat in front of the elders' faces again. This man, for some reason, had bitterness in his heart. He wanted there to be a war. He attacked us, knowing he would be killed, wanting it, so it would start the war, and his people could kill all the mud people. Don't you see, with the banquet going on, they will hear the sounds of it far onto the plain. They will know we are not prepared to defend ourselves, that we are diverted. They are coming, now! The elders all leaned back a little. The birdman turned to Chandelin. Richard, with the temper, has had a vision from our enemy. Have each of your men gather ten others. We must not allow the Bantak to harm our people. You will stop them before they reach the village. Chandelin's eyes flashed to Richard and then back to the birdman. We will see if his vision is true. I will lead our men east. If they are coming, we will stop them. No, Richard screamed when Kalen translated. They will come from the north. North? Chandelin glared at him. The Bantak live to the east, not the north. They will come from the east. They will expect you to defend to the east. They think the mud people want to kill them. They expect it. They will flank you and come from the north. Chandelin folded his arms. The Bantak are not fighters. They do not know of such tactics. If they are going to attack us, as you say, they will simply come straight in. As you said, they will hear the banquet. They will know we will be unprepared. They have no reason to go all the way around and come in from the north. It would only slow them down for no reason. Richard glared at him. They are coming from the north. Was this part of your vision? The birdman asked. Did you see this too, from eating the meat? Richard forced out a breath and looked down. No, I didn't see it with the rest of the vision. He ran his fingers through his hair. But I know it's true. I don't know how, but I know. They are coming from the north. The birdman turned to Chandelin. Perhaps you could split the men, take some to the east and some to the north. Chandelin shook his head. No. If the vision proves true, we will need all our men together. One strike with surprise with all our men and with luck will end it. If there are enough of them, as he seems to think, then they might defeat a number that small. And then they would be upon our people before we could turn them back. Many women and children would be killed. The whole village could fall. It is too dangerous. The birdman nodded. Chandelin, a vision has been presented to us. It is your job to keep our people safe. Since the vision did not say which way they would come, only that they would come, I leave it to you to protect us as you see best. You are the smartest fighter among us. I will trust your fighting judgment. He frowned and leaned closer to the man. But know that it had better be a fighting judgment and not a personal one. Chandelin showed no emotion. It is my opinion the Bantak would attack from the east. He glanced at Richard. If they really come. Richard put a hand on Chandelin's folded arm. Chandelin, please listen to me. His voice was quiet and worried. I know you don't like me. Maybe you are justified in your feelings. Maybe you are right that I have brought trouble to our people. But trouble is coming now, and it is coming from the north. Please, I beg you, believe me. The lives of all our people depend on this. Hate me all you want, but don't let any of them die because of that hate. Richard drew the sword of truth and held out the hilt. I will give you my sword. Go north. If they come from the east and I am wrong, you may kill me with it. Chandelin looked down at the sword and back up to Richard's face. A small smile spread on his own. I will not let you trick me. I will not let our people be devastated just for a chance to kill you. I would rather let you live among us than let my people be killed. 
I go to the east. He turned and strode off, shouting instructions to his men. Richard stood watching him go, then slid the sword back into its scabbard. That man is a fool, Kalin said. Richard shook his head. He is just doing what he thinks best. He wants to protect his people more than he wants to kill me. If I had to pick one man to fight beside me, as much as he hates me, it would be him. I am a fool for not being able to make him see the truth. He turned to her. I have to go north. I have to stop them. Kalin looked around. There are some other men here. We will gather all we can and... He shook his head, cutting her off. No, there wouldn't be enough. Besides, we need every man able to hold a bow or a spear here to defend the village if I fail. The elders must go on with the banquet. We must have the gathering. That is what's most important. I'll go along. I'm the seeker. Maybe I can stop them. Maybe they will listen to one man, see that he isn't so much of a threat. All right, wait here. I'll be right back. Why? I have to put on my confessor's dress. You're not going. I have to. You can't speak their language. Kaylin, I don't want... Richard. She snatched a fistful of his shirt. I'm the mother confessor. There will be no war under my nose while I have a say in it. You will wait here. She released his shirt and stormed off. The mother confessor didn't wait for answers to her instructions. She expected them to be carried out. She suddenly regretted yelling at Richard, but she was furious at Chandelin for not listening. She was furious, too, at the Vantak. She had been to their village before and always found them to be a gentle people. Whatever their reasons, as long as she was around, there was going to be no war. The mother confessor was supposed to stop wars, not sit by and watch them start. This was her responsibility, her job, not Richard's. At Savidlin and Wesselon's home, in the dark, with all the noise going on outside, she slipped into her white confessor's dress. All confessors wore dresses, cut the same, square at the neck, long, simple, free of embellishment, and satiny smooth, but of black fabric. Only the mother confessor's was white. It was a mantle of power. In the dress, she was not Kaelin Amnell. She was the mother confessor, a symbol of the power of truth. With all the other confessors now dead, the weight of defending the Midlands, those without power, was upon her shoulders. It made her feel different now to wear the dress. Before, it had seemed the normal thing to do. Now, since she had met Richard, it seemed a heavier responsibility. Before, she had always felt alone in her job, but now, with him, she felt more of a connection to the people of the Midlands, more one of them, more responsible to them. She knew now what it was to love someone and to fear for him. She was not going to allow anyone to start a war, not as long as she was the mother confessor. She grabbed their heavy cloaks and went back through the passageways to the festivities. The elders were standing in front of their platform where she had left them. Richard was still waiting. She tossed his cloak to him and addressed the elders. Tomorrow night is the gathering. It must go on. We will be back well before then. She turned to the wives. Wesselon, we wish to be married the next day. I'm sorry there isn't more time to prepare, but we must leave as soon as it is done. We must go to Aidendril. We must stop the threat to the mud people and everyone else. Wesselon smiled. Your dress will be ready. I wish we could give you a big wedding feast, but we understand. The birdman put a hand on her shoulder. If Chandelin is wrong, be careful. The Bantak are peaceful, but maybe things have changed. Tell them we wish their people no harm. We do not want war with them. Kaelin nodded and flung her cloak around her shoulders as she started off. Let's go. Chapter 15 Richard fell in beside her without objection. Without speaking, they left the village and went north, out onto the flat, open grasslands. As they walked, the sounds of the people in boldas and drums faded steadily into the night. The moon wasn't near full, but it gave them enough light to see by as they walked through the waist-high, dry grass. They hoped that it was dark enough to make them poor targets. Richard finally glanced over. Caleb, I'm sorry. For what? For forgetting who you are, that you are the mother confessor, and that this is your job. I was just worried for you. Page 163. She was surprised by his apology. 
I'm sorry I yelled at you. I shouldn't have done that. I just don't want there to be any fighting. I'm supposed to keep the people of the Midlands from fighting. It makes me angry when they insist on killing one another. Richard, I'm so tired of seeing people killed. I thought it was over. I can't bear it anymore. I swear I can't. He put an arm around her. I know. Me too. He gave her shoulder a squeeze as they walked. The mother confessor will put a stop to it. He looked over. She thought he was frowning, but it was too dark to be sure. With my help. She grinned. With your help. She leaned her head against him a moment. From now on, always with your help. They walked a long way from the village without seeing anything but the black ground and starlit sky. Richard would stop once in a while to watch the surrounding grassland and take out a few of Nissel's leaves to chew. Sometimes, past the middle of the night, they came to a slight depression in the landscape. He looked around again and then decided they should wait where they were. It would be better for the Bantak to come upon them, he said, than for the two of them to walk into a surprise. Richard flattened out a small patch of grass and they sat down to wait. They each took turns taking little naps while the other watched to the north. With her hand over his, she watched him sleep and scanned the horizon and thought about all the times they had done this before, one standing watch, the other sleeping. She longed for the day they could just sleep and not have to watch. Sleep together. It would happen, she decided, soon enough. Richard would figure out how to close the veil, and then it would be over. They could be at peace. Kaylin slept nuzzled against him with her cloak wrapped tight against the cold. His warmth made her all the more sleepy. She began to wonder if he was right, if the Bantak would come from the north. If they came from the east, there would be a lot of killing. Chandelin would show no mercy. She didn't want the mud people to be hurt, but she didn't want the Bantak hurt either. They too were her people. She drifted into worried sleep, her last thoughts of Richard. He brought her awake, pressing his arm around her and his hand over her mouth. The sky was just beginning to lighten to their right, to the east. Thin wisps of dark purple clouds bunched near the horizon, as if trying to mask the sunrise with their dark hue. Richard was watching to the north. She was lower than he and couldn't see anything, but she knew by the tenseness of his muscles that someone was coming. They lay still, close to the ground, waiting. Gentle breezes rustled the dry grass around them. Kaylin, quietly, slowly, slid the cloak from her shoulders. She didn't want there to be any mistake about who she was. The Bantak would recognize her long hair, but she wanted them to see her confessor's dress, too. She didn't want there to be any doubt who she was and that she was here as the mother confessor. Richard shrugged his cloak off his shoulders. Shadows slid through the grass around them. When there seemed to be men all around, the two of them stood up. Men with spears and bows closest leapt back and screamed yells of surprise. The Bantak were spread out in a long, thin line, advancing toward the mud people's village. There were excited shouts. Men swept in from the line, a few surrounding them, most bunched in front. Kaylin stood tall, her hands at her sides. She wore her confessor's face a calm that showed nothing, as her mother had taught her. Richard was tight at her side, his hand on the hilt of his sword. Most of the men, in simple hide clothes trimmed with grass, leveled weapons at the two of them. They were clearly nervous about doing so. You would dare to threaten the mother confessor? She called out. Lower your weapons, now! Eyes flicked around, looking to see if the two of them were alone. The men seemed to become less sure about pointing spears and arrows at the mother confessor. They were doing something unheard of, and they knew it. They looked as if they couldn't decide to keep doing what they were doing or drop their weapons and fall to their knees. A few of them crouched lower in half bows. Kalin took an aggressive stride toward them. Now! The men flinched, cowering back a little. The points of all the weapons moved from her to Richard. They appeared to hope this would be an acceptable compromise. It was not what she had expected. She stepped in front of Richard. All the weapons were once again pointing at her. What do you think you are doing? He whispered to the back of her head. Just stay quiet. Let me try to do this. We don't have a chance if we can't get them to lower their weapons and talk. 
Why are they doing this? I thought everyone was afraid of the Mother Confessor. They are afraid, but they are used to seeing a wizard with me. They may be more bold because they don't see one now. Even so, they shouldn't be doing this. She took another step forward. Who speaks for the Bantak? Who among you takes responsibility for allowing the Bantak to threaten the Mother Confessor? Not being able to point their weapons at Richard with her in the way, the Bantak lost a bit of their confidence and lowered the points a little. Not all the way, but a little. At last, an old man approached, pushing through, stopping in front of her. He wore simple hide clothes, like the other men, but around his neck hung a gold medallion worked with Bantak symbols. She knew him. He was Ma Ban Grid, the Bantak spirit guide. His scowl made his heavily wrinkled loose skin seem even more deeply creased than she remembered. She also didn't remember him scowling like this. She remembered only his easy smile. I speak for the Bantak, Ma Ban Grid said. He had only two bottom teeth in his front. His jaw wobbled easily with the difficult-to-pronounce Bantak words. He glanced at Richard. Who is this one? Kalin returned Ma Ban Grid's scowl. Now Ma Ban Grid would question the Mother Confessor before she is welcomed before his eyes? The Bantak men shuffled their feet uneasily. Ma Ban Grid did not. His gaze was solid and unwavering. These are not right times. These are not our lands. We are not here to welcome visitors before the eyes of the Bantak. We have come to kill the mud people. Why? Ma Ban Grid peered down his nose at her. They have invited war. As our spirit brethren have warned us, they would. They have proven it by killing one of mine. We must kill them before they kill us all. There will be no war. There will be no killing. I am the Mother Confessor, and I will not allow it. The Bantak will suffer by my hand if they do this. The band of men broke into worried whispers and moved back a pace. The spirit guide stood his ground. The spirit brethren have also told me that the mother confessor no longer holds command over the people of the Midlands. They say that is proof she has been stripped of the company of a wizard. He gave her a smug look. I see no wizard. As always, the spirits speak true to Ma Ban Grid. Kalin stared speechless at the old man. Richard leaned toward her. What are they saying? Kalin told him what Ma Ban Grid had said. He stepped up next to her. I want to speak to them. Translate for me. Kalin nodded. They wanted to know who you are. I didn't tell them. Richard's eyes turned cold with menace. I will let them know who I am. His voice took on the same cold quality as his eyes. And they aren't going to like it. He turned his hawk-like glare on the men, deliberately ignoring Ma Ban Grid and she saw in those eyes the rage of the sword's magic. He was calling the magic forth even as the sword sat in its scabbard. You men are following an old fool, an old fool by the name of Ma Ban Grid, who is not wise enough to know true spirits from false spirits. The men gasped at the insult. Richard turned his penetrating gaze to Ma Ban Grid. Is this not true, old fool? Ma Ban Grid stammered with anger a moment before he could get any words out. Who are you to dare to insult me like this? Richard glared at him. Your false spirits told you the mud people killed one of yours. The false spirits lied to you, and you in your foolishness believed them. Lie. We found his head. The mud people killed him. They want war with us. We will kill them all, every last one. They have killed one of mine. I am growing tired of talking to one as stupid as you, old man. The Bantak are a witless people if they put one such as you in charge of talking to the spirit brethren. Richard, what are you doing? She whispered. Translate. When she did, Ma Ban Grid's face reddened more with each word. He looked ready to burst into flames. Richard leaned closer to him. The mud people didn't kill the one that was yours. I did. Richard, I can't tell them that. They will kill us. He continued to glare at Ma Ban Grid as he spoke softly to her. Something is frightening these people into doing this. They are going to kill us and then go and kill a lot of the mud people unless I can make them even more frightened of us. Translate. She let out a noisy breath at him and then told the Ban Tak what Richard had said. The weapons came back up. You! You killed one of mine! Richard shrugged. Yes. He pointed at his forehead. 
I put an arrow right here, one arrow, right here, right through his head, as he was about to put his spear in the back of a man, a man who had no hate in his heart for the Bantak. I killed him as I would kill a coyote sneaking up to steal one of my lambs. One who would take a life by such cowardice deserves to die. One who would listen to false spirits and send one of his own to do such a thing does not deserve to lead a people. We will kill you. Really? Maybe you will try, but you cannot kill me. Richard turned his back to the old man and walked about twenty paces away. The men opening up to let him pass. He turned back. I used one arrow to kill one of yours. Use one arrow to try to kill me, and we will see who the good spirits protect. Pick any man you wish. Have him do to me as I did to yours. Shoot me with an arrow. He pointed angrily at his forehead again. Right here, where I shot the coward who would kill for false spirits. Richard, have you lost your mind? I'm not going to tell them to shoot you. Kalen, I can do this. I can feel it. You did it once. What if it doesn't work this time? I'm not going to stand here and let you be killed. Kalen, if we don't stop these people here, now, both of us are going to be killed, and then the keeper is going to escape. Tonight is the gathering. That is what's important. I'm using the wizard's first rule. The first step to believing is wanting to believe something is true, or being afraid it is. Up until now... They have been believing something because they wanted to. I have to make them afraid that what I am going to say is true. What are you going to say? Hurry up. Translate before I lose their interest and they decide to kill us and then go after the mud people. She turned back to Maban Grid and reluctantly translated. The men all started shouting that they wanted to be the one to shoot the arrow. Maban Grid's eyes moved among them as they yelled and waved their arms. He smiled. All you men may shoot this evil one who has killed one of mine. Everyone, shoot him! The bows came up. Richard glared. Coward! Do you men see how foolish this old man is? He knows he listens to false spirits. He would have you listen to them also. He knows the good spirits protect me in my challenge. He is afraid to have you see he is a fool. This proves it. Maban Grid's jaw tightened. He held his arm up for his men to halt. At last, he turned to a man with a bow and snatched it from his hands. I will show you the spirits I hear are true. You will die for killing one of mine, for saying our spirit brethren are false spirits. He drew a poison arrow back and in a blink shot it at Richard. A cheer rose from the men. Kalin's breath caught in her throat. She went cold with fear. Richard snatched the arrow out of the air right in front of his face. The men gasped and then fell silent as Richard marched back to the spirit guide, the arrow in his hand and fire in his eyes. He stopped before Maban Grid and snapped the arrow in front of his face to the sound of fearful murmurs. His voice was deadly. The good spirits protect me, old fool. You listen to false spirits. Who are you? Maban Grid whispered, wide-eyed. Richard slowly drew the sword of truth, the soft ring of steel filled the quiet dawn. He placed the sword's point at Maban Grid's throat. I am Richard, the seeker, mate to the mother confessor. Worried whispers drifted through the cold air. And I am a wizard, her wizard. Eyes as far as she could see widened. Jaws dropped. Maban Grid's face slackened a little. He glanced to the crowd. Wizard? You? Wizard! Richard's angry glare swept across the gathered men. Wizard, I command the magic, the gift. It would seem, old fool, your false spirits have lied to you. They said the Mother Confessor had no wizard. They sent one of yours to start a war the mud people do not want. They have used you for their own purposes. Perhaps a wise spirit guide would have known this. Perhaps an old fool would not grumbling broke out among the men. If you persist in this, if you disobey the mother confessor, I will use my magic to destroy you. I will use terrible magic to burn the Bantak's land to ashes and put a blight upon it for all time. Each Bantak will die a horrible death, a death by my magic. I will kill every last Bantak. 
young and old. His cold gray eyes returned to Ma Ban Grid. But I will start with the old. Magic? Ma Ban Grid whispered. You would kill us with magic? Richard leaned closer. If you disobey the Mother Confessor, I will kill you all with magic more frightful than anything you can imagine. As the men all listened in rapt attention to her translation, Richard recited a litany of horrors he would bring to them. Most of the things she remembered Zed telling a mob that had come to kill him when they thought he was a witch. Richard was using the same things now to scare the Bantak. The more he spoke, the wider their eyes became. Ma Ban Grid's gaze left the sword and returned to Richard's face. He looked less sure of himself, but wasn't entirely ready to concede. The spirits told me there was no wizard with the Mother Confessor. Why should I believe you are a wizard? All of the anger left Richard's face. She had never seen him hold the sword without the fury of the sword's magic in his eyes. There did seem to be something in his eyes, but it wasn't hate or rage. He looked at peace. Somehow, it was more frightening than the anger. It was the peace of a man committed to a course. In the dim dawn light, the blade of Richard's sword changed. It began to glow white, white hot with magic. It brightened until no one could miss seeing the bright white luminescence. Richard was using the only magic he knew and could depend on, the magic of the sword. It was enough. Fear swept the crowd. Men fell to their knees, dropping their weapons, muttering for forgiveness, beseeching the spirits to protect them. Others stood frozen, not knowing what to do. Forgive me, old man, Richard whispered, but I must kill you to save a great many more lives. Know that I forgive you and regret what I must do. As she translated, Kalin put a hand on Richard's arm to keep him from doing anything. Richard, wait. Please give me a chance. He nodded slightly. One chance. Fail and I kill him. She knew he was trying to scare the Bantak, to break the spell they seemed to be under, but he was scaring her too. He was beyond the rage of the sword to something worse. She looked back to the spirit guide. Ma Ban Grid, Richard will kill you. He does not lie about this. I have asked him to wait, so I may grant you my forgiveness if you will see the truth of what we say. I can ask him not to kill you, and he will do as I ask, but only once. After that, I will have no control over him. If you are insincere in your change of heart, there will be much death and suffering. Richard is a man of his word. He has made a promise to you, and if you try to trick him with your answer, he will keep his promise. I give you this one chance to hear the truth. It is not yet too late. The Mother Confessor does not want any of her people to die. Every life in the Midlands holds dear value in my heart. But sometimes I must let a few lose their lives so that many more may live. I will hear your answer. The men all stood stooped and still. They looked as if they had gotten themselves into something they no longer wanted. The Bantak were a peaceful people, and they seemed to regret their foray, even seemed confused by it. Richard had succeeded in giving them a bigger fright than whatever brought them to this. The breeze fluttered the dry grass, and in its passing pulled a stray wisp of hair across her face. Kaylin reached up and pulled it back as she waited. With eyes that seemed to have gone empty of passion, Ma Ban Grid searched her face. The spell had been broken. His voice came soft and sincere. I heard the spirits speak. I thought they were speaking the truth. It is as he says. I am an old fool. He looked around at his silent men. The Bantak have never before sought to bring death to others. We will not start now. He bowed his head and pulled his medallion over his wispy gray hair. He brought it up in both hands, offering it to her. Please, Mother Confessor, give this to the mud people. Tell them it is given in peace. We will start no war with them. He glanced over. Richard returned the sword to its scabbard. Ma Ban Grid looked back to her. Thank you for stopping us, for stopping me from listening to false spirits and doing a terrible thing. Kaylin bowed her head to the old man. I am thankful I was able to serve in time to prevent anyone from being hurt. Richard glanced to her. Ask him how the spirits convinced him to do something against the nature of his people. Ma Bangrid, 
How did the spirits put the lust for war in your heart, the lust for killing? He stared off, unsure. Their whispers came to me in the night, made me feel the need. I have felt an urge to violence before, but never acted on it. This time, it seemed I could not hold it back. I had never felt this need so strongly before. The veil to the underworld, the spirit world, is torn. Whispers spread back through the men as she told them Richard's words. False spirits may seek to speak to you again. Be on guard against them. I understand how you were tricked and will hold no anger against you for it. But I expect you to be more cautious now that you have learned the truth and have been warned. Thank you, wizard. Mabangrid nodded. I will make it so. Did the spirit voices tell you anything else? The old man frowned in thought. I don't really remember their voices telling me what must be done. It was more of a feeling that filled me with the need. My son, he looked up, the one who died, he was with me and heard them also. I felt that the spirit spoke differently to him somehow. His eyes were wild, with hate, even more than mine. He went as soon as we were visited by the spirits. His gaze sank to the ground. Richard regarded the spirit guide a long moment. His voice came softly. I am sorry, Ma Bungrid, that I had to kill your son. It wounds my heart to have done so. Know that had there been any other path, I would have taken it. The old man nodded, but couldn't bring forth words. He looked around at his men. He seemed suddenly ashamed. I don't know what we are doing here, he whispered. This is not the Bantak way. It is the fault of false spirits. I am glad we were here to help you see the truth of it, Richard said. He nodded again and turned to his men, looking about at them, and then walked off toward their homeland. Kalin let out a heavy sigh. Richard watched warily as the Bantak plodded off into the sunrise, dragging spears behind. What do you make of that? she asked when he turned to her at last. He rested his hand on the hilt of the sword and turned to watch the Bantak. The keeper is getting ahead of us. He looked back to her eyes. He has taken the effort to discredit you to discredit the Mother Confessor. He is laying traps for us. He has plans, and I don't have the slightest idea what they are. What are we going to do? What we plan to do. Tonight we have the gathering, and tomorrow we are married and leave for Aidendril. She studied his face. You really are a wizard, she said softly. You used magic to break the Keeper's spell. His expression didn't change. No, I'm not. It was just a little trick Zed taught me. He said once that people are more afraid to die from magic than anything else, as if they would somehow be more dead. I used that fear and the wizard's first rule to make them believe it. It was a stronger fear than the one the spirits gave them. And what of turning the sword of truth white? He regarded her a long moment. Do you remember when Zed showed us how the sword works? How it couldn't harm anyone you think innocent? She nodded. Well, he was wrong. When it is white, you can kill anyone. Anyone. Even one you know to be innocent. Even one you love. His eyes hardened. I hate magic. Richard, the gift has just helped you save the lives of many people. At what cost, he whispered. Whenever I even think of turning the sword white, all I can remember is how I did it to you. How I almost killed you with it. But you didn't. Almost doesn't make bread rise. That doesn't stop the pain of it. Or of having killed with the sword's white magic and of knowing what I am capable of. It makes me feel like a rawl. He let out a heavy breath and changed the subject. I think we had better be very careful at the gathering tonight. Richard, this puts a new light on things. We have been warned twice now of the danger of dealing with the spirits. Won't you reconsider the gathering? He looked away. What choice do I have? The keeper seems to be ahead of us. Events are moving fast. The more we find out, the more we realize we don't know. We must learn what we can. But maybe the ancestor spirits won't be able to help us. Then we will have learned something. We can't pass up the chance. Too much is at risk. We have to try. He gently took her hand. Kalen... I can't allow myself to be responsible for this, to know it's my fault. She waited until his eyes came up. Why? Because Dark and Rahl is your father? You think you are responsible because you are a Rahl? Maybe. 
But Rawl or not, I can't be responsible for the Keeper having everyone. For having you. I have to find a way to stop it. Dark and Rawl haunts me from the grave. Somehow I have caused this. I don't know how, but it's my fault. I have to do whatever it takes to stop it, or everyone will suffer, and the Keeper will have you forever. That thought scares me more than anything in my life has ever scared me. It wakes me with nightmares. There isn't anything I wouldn't do to stop him from getting you. I won't take a chance of missing anything, no matter the risk. I have to have the gathering. His gaze held hers. Even though I fear it might be a trap, I have to try. A trap? You think it might be a trap? It could be. We have been warned. At least we can be alert for it. He looked down at her hand in his. I won't have the sword in the gathering. Do you think you can call down the lightning if you have to? Kaylin shook her head. I don't know, Richard. I don't know how I did it. It just happened. I don't know how to control it. He nodded as he rubbed the back of her hand with his thumbs. Well, maybe you won't have to try. Maybe the ancestors' spirits will be able to help us. They helped us before. Richard reached up and gripped the age eel. His gray eyes were filled with the pain of the headache. He sank down and put his head in his hands as she sat next to him. I have to rest a while before we go back. This headache is killing me. She feared he was right, that the headache really was killing him. She ached for the next day when they could get to Zed, get to help. It was late afternoon by the time they returned to the celebration, the banquet. Richard's head was a little better, but still hurt him enough to leave the pain in his eyes. The elders stood as the two of them approached the open pole shelter. The birdman stepped forward. What of the Bantak? Did you see them? There has been no word from Chandalen. Kalin held the gold medallion out to him and let it drop in his hand when it came up. We found them to the north, as Richard said we would. Maban Grid sent this as a gift to tell the mud people that the Bantak will not make war with them. They made a mistake and are sorry. We made them see that the mud people mean them no harm. Chandalen has also made a mistake. The birdman nodded solemnly and turned to a hunter standing nearby, telling him to bring back Chandalen and his men. Kalin didn't think he looked as pleased as she thought he would be. Honored Elder, is something wrong? His brown eyes seemed heavy. He glanced to Richard and back to her. Two of the Sisters of Light have returned. They wait in the spirit house. Kalin's heart jumped. She had hoped they wouldn't be back so soon. What had it been, only a few days? She turned to Richard. The Sisters of the Light are waiting in the spirit house. Richard sighed. Nothing is ever easy. He addressed the birdman. Tonight is the gathering. Will you be ready? Tonight the spirits will be with us. We will be ready. Be careful. Take nothing for granted. All our lives depend on it. He took her arm. Let's see if we can put a stop to this. They walked together across the field, past the roar of the fires. People were still everywhere, eating, dancing, playing the boldas and drums. There were fewer children about. Some were off napping, but some still managed to dance and play. Three days, he muttered. What? It's been three days almost since they were here last. I will send them away, and tomorrow we will be gone. When they come back in another three days, we will have been in Aiden Drill for two. She stared ahead as they walked. That is, if they keep to the same schedule. Who says they won't show up for the third time after only one day? Or one hour? She could feel his eyes on her, but she didn't look over when he spoke. Are you trying to make a point? You only get three chances, Richard. I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid of the headaches. This time she did look over, but he didn't. I won't wear a collar. Not for any reason, not for anyone. I know, she whispered. He yanked the door open and strode into the spirit house. His jaw was set with determination. His eyes fixed on the two women standing in the center of the dimly lit room as he marched up to them. Both wore their cloaks with the hoods pushed back. Their faces in mild frowns seemed almost calm. Richard stopped in front of the two. I have questions, and I want answers. We are glad to see you are still well, Richard, Sister Verna said, still alive. Why did Sister Grace kill herself? 
Why did you allow it? Sister Elizabeth stepped in front of Sister Verna. She held the open collar in her hands. We told you before, discussion is over. It is by the rules now. I have rules, too. With his fists on his hips, he looked to each woman in turn. My first rule is that neither of you is going to kill herself today. They ignored him. You will listen. I, Sister of the Light, Elizabeth Merrick, give the second reason for the Radahan. Give the second chance to be helped. The first of the three reasons for the Radahan is to control the headaches and open your mind so you may be taught to use the gift. You have refused the first chance to be helped. I bring the second reason and offer. She watched his eyes as if to be sure she had his full attention. The second reason for the Radahan is so that we may be able to control you. Richard glared at her. Control me? What does that mean, to control me? It means what it says. I'm not putting a collar around my neck so you may control me. He leaned a little closer, or for any other reason. Sister Elizabeth held the collar up. As you were told before, it is more difficult for you to accept the second offer. Please believe us, you are in great danger. Your time is running out. Please, Richard, accept the second offer now, on the second of the three reasons and offers. It will only be much more difficult to accept on the third of the three reasons. There was something in his eyes Kalin had seen only once before, the last time the caller was held out to him. Something alien, something frightening. It sent a chill through her. Goosebumps rose on her arms. The anger left her voice. I told you before, he whispered, I will not wear a collar for anyone, for any reason. If you want to teach me to use the gift to control it, we can talk about it. There are things going on you know nothing about, important things, dangerous things. I have responsibilities as the seeker. I am not a child like you are used to dealing with. I am an adult. We can talk about it. Sister Elizabeth stared at him with fierce intensity. Richard retreated a half-step. His eyes closed and he shook slightly. At last he straightened. His eyes came open as he took a deep breath. He returned the sister's stare. Something had happened, and Kalin had no idea what it was. The strength in Sister Elizabeth's eyes waned. Her hands lowered the collar. Her voice came in a fearful whisper. Will you accept the offer and the Radahan? Richard stood staring at her. The power was back in his voice. I refuse. Sister Elizabeth went pale as she stared back for a moment before turning to the woman behind her. Forgive me, sister. I have failed. She put the Radahan in Sister Verna's outstretched hand. Her voice came in a whisper. It is upon you now. Sister Verna kissed her on each cheek. The light forgives you, sister. Sister Elizabeth turned back to Richard, her face gone slack. May the light cradle you always with gentle hands. May you someday find the way. Richard stood with his fists on his hips as he watched her eyes. She lifted her chin. As Sister Grace had done, she brought her arm up, and with a flick of her wrist, brought the silver-handled knife to her hand. Richard continued to watch her as she flipped it around toward herself. Kalen watched, holding her breath spellbound as the woman prepared to kill herself. The silence seemed thick. For a heartbeat, everyone was stone still. The instant the knife began to move, Richard did too. His speed was shocking. Before Sister Elizabeth realized what had happened, Richard had her by her wrist. His other hand came up and began prying the odd knife from her fingers as she struggled to keep a hold of it. She was no match for his strength. I told you my rule. You are not allowed to kill yourself today. Her face twisted with futile effort. Please, let go. Her body flinched. Her head jerked back. There was a flash of light that seemed to come from within her. From within her eyes, Sister Elizabeth crumpled forward to the ground. Sister Verna, pulling her own knife from the woman's back as she fell. Sister Verna's gaze rose from the dead woman to Richard. You must bury her body yourself. If you let another do it for you, you will have nightmares for the rest of your life, nightmares caused by magic. There is no cure for them. You killed her. You murdered her. What's the matter with you? How could you kill her? She tucked her knife up her sleeve as she glared at him. 
She reached out, snatching the silver knife from his hand and slipped it in her cloak. You killed her, Sister Verna whispered. Your hands have the blood on them. So does the executioner's axe, but it doesn't wield itself. Richard lunged for her throat. She didn't move. She simply continued to stare at him. His hands stopped before reaching her. Richard shook, straining against an invisible barrier as she watched him. In that instant, Kaylin knew what the sisters were. Richard relaxed the pressure of pushing against the barrier. He pulled his hands back a little. He visibly relaxed. Gently, his face gone calm, he reached one hand toward Sister Verna. His fingers clutched around her throat. Her eyes went wide with shock. Richard, she whispered angrily, take your hand from me. As you have said, this is no game. Why did you kill her? His weight came off his feet. Richard floated a few inches into the air. He tightened his grip on her throat. When he didn't release her, fire ignited all around them, roaring to life, a whirl of flame closing around him. I said, take your hand from me. In a moment more, the fire would consume Richard. Before she realized what she was doing, Kaylin had her fist out toward the sister. Blue light crackled all around her wrist and hand. Little threads of blue lightning escaped from the sides as she struggled to restrain herself from releasing the bolt of power. Wisps of blue fire sizzled forth throughout the spirit house, up the walls, across the ceiling and floor, everywhere except where the other two stood. She shook with the strain of holding back the power. Stop it! The threads of blue lightning sucked the fire into them. There will be no more killing today. The blue light extinguished. Silence again filled the room as Sister Verna stared at Kaylin. A hard edge of anger stole into her eyes. Richard settled to the ground and took his hand from the woman's throat. I wouldn't have harmed him. I only meant to frighten him into releasing me. She turned her glare to Richard. Who taught you to break a web? No one taught me. I taught myself. Why did you kill Sister Elizabeth? You taught yourself, she mocked. I told you this is no game. It must go by the rules. Her voice lost its edge. I have known her for many years. If you had ever turned that sword of yours white, you would understand what it took for me to do as I did. Richard didn't tell her he had turned the sword white. You would expect me to put myself in your hands after what you have done? Your time is running out, Richard. After what I have seen today, I would be surprised if the headaches don't kill you. I don't know why it is that the pain hasn't already put you down. Whatever is protecting you won't last much longer. I know you don't like to see anyone die. Neither do we. But please believe that what is done is done for you, to save you. She turned to Kaelin. Be very careful with that power of yours, Mother Confessor. I doubt you have the slightest idea how dangerous it is. Sister Verna pulled her hood up as her brown eyes turned to Richard. You have been offered the first and second of three chances and refused. I will return. She leaned a little closer. You only have one chance left. If you refuse it, you will die. Think on it carefully, Richard. After the door closed behind Sister Verna, Richard squatted next to the dead sister. She was doing something to me. Magic. I could feel it. What did it feel like? Richard shook his head a little. The first time they were here, I thought I felt something pulling me to accept their offer, but I was so afraid of the caller I paid it no attention. This time it was much stronger. It was magic. The magic was trying to force me to say yes to accept the offer from the sisters. I just thought about the collar until the force left and I was able to say no. He looked up at her. You have any idea what's going on? What she was doing and what Sister Verna did with the fire and the rest of it? Kalen's hand still tingled from the blue lightning. Yes, the sisters are sorceresses. Richard rose smoothly to his feet. Sorceresses? He watched her eyes for a long moment. Why would they kill themselves when I said no? I think it is to pass their power on to the next sister to make her stronger for when they try again. He looked down at the body. Why would I be so important that they would kill themselves to get me? Maybe it is as they say, to help you. He glanced at her out of the corner of his eye. They don't want one man, a stranger, to die, yet two of them have already died trying to get me to accept their help so a life wouldn't be lost? How does that add up? 
I don't know, Richard, but I'm so scared it hurts. I'm afraid they could be telling the truth, that you don't have much time and the headaches are killing you. I'm afraid you won't be able to control them much longer. Her voice broke with emotion. I don't want to lose you. Richard slipped his arms around her. It will be all right. I will bury her. The gathering will be in a few hours. Tomorrow we will be in Aiden Drill, and then I will be safe. Zed will know what to do. She could only nod against his shoulder. Chapter 16 Kaylin sat naked in the circle with eight naked men. Richard was to her left, painted, as were she and the elders, with the black and white mud except in a small circle in the center of his chest. In the dim light coming from the small fire behind her, she could see the wild jumble of lines and swirls sweeping diagonally across his face. They all wore the same mask, so that the ancestor spirits might see them. She wondered if she looked as savage to him as he looked to her. The unfamiliar acrid smell from the fire made her nose itch. None of the elders scratched their noses. They only stared at nothing and chanted sacred words to the spirits. The door slammed shut by itself, making her jump. The birdman's distant eyes came up. From now until we are finished, near dawn, no one may go out, no one may come in. The door is barred by the spirits. Kalen didn't like the idea that, as Richard had said, this could be a trap. She squeezed his hand more tightly. He returned the squeeze. At least she thought she was with him. She hoped she could protect him. She hoped she could call the lightning if she had to. The birdman fished out a frog and then passed the woven basket to the next elder. Kalen stared at the skulls arranged in a circle in the center as each elder took a frog and began rubbing its back against the bare circle of skin on his chest. As they did so, each rolled his head back and chanted different words. Without looking over, Savadlin passed her the basket. Closing her eyes, she reached inside and finally caught a squirming, kicking spirit frog. Its smooth, slimy skin was revolting. Swallowing hard and taking a mental grip on her confessor's power to try to keep from releasing it unintentionally, she pressed the frog's back to the skin between her breasts as she passed the basket to Richard. Tingling tightness spread across her skin. She freed the frog and took up Richard's hand once more as the walls began to waver, as if seen through heat and smoke. Her mind tried in vain to hold on to the images of the spirit house around her. They drifted away as she felt herself spinning around the skulls. Soft sensations caressed her skin. Light danced from the skulls in the center and filled her eyes. Sounds of the boldas and drums and chanting filled her ears. The pungent smell from the fire filled her lungs. As once before, the light from the center brightened, taking them into it, into the silken void, spinning them around. And then there were shapes around them. Kalin remembered them, too, from before, the ancestors' spirits. She felt a gossamer touch on her shoulder, a hand, a spirit hand. The birdman's mouth moved, but it wasn't his voice. It was the joined voices of the ancestors' spirits, flat, hollow, dead. Who calls this gathering? Kalin leaned toward Richard and whispered, They want to know who calls this gathering. He nodded. I do. I call this gathering. The touch left her shoulder, and the spirits all floated from behind them into the center of the circle. Speak your name. The echo of their voices sent ripples of pain along the skin of her arms. Your full and true name. If you are certain that you wish this gathering despite the danger, speak the request after your name. You get but this one warning. Richard stared at her translation. Richard, please. I have to. He looked back to the spirits in the center and took a deep breath. I am Richard. He swallowed and closed his eyes for a moment. I am Richard Rall, and I request this gathering. So be it, came the empty whispers. The door to the spirit house crashed open. Kalen jumped with a little shriek. She felt Richard's hand flinch, too. The doorway stood open, a black maw in the soft light around them. The elders all looked up, their eyes no longer glazed with the distant vision. They seemed confused, dazed. 
the spirit voices came again, this time not through the elders, but from the center, from the spirits themselves. The sound of it was even more painful than before. All but the one who calls the ancestors' spirits may leave. Leave while you still can. Heed our warning. Those who remain behind with him risk forfeiting their souls. They turned as one to Richard. Their voices were a hiss. You may not leave. The elder's frightened eyes flicked around to each other as she translated for Richard. Kalin knew. This had never happened before. Everyone out, Richard whispered. Have everyone get out. I don't want them hurt. Kalin looked to the birdman's worried eyes. Please, all of you, leave now, while you can. We don't want harm to come to any of you. The elders all looked to the birdman. He stared at her a moment, glanced at Richard, and then back to her. I can offer you no guidance, child. This has never happened before. I don't know what it means. Kayla nodded. I understand. Go now, before it is too late. Savadlin touched her shoulder, and then the elders vanished as they walked through the black void of the doorway. She sat in the quiet with Richard, with the spirits. Kalin, I want you out of here, too. Go. Now. His voice was calm, almost cold. Fear danced in his eyes. And magic. She watched his face as he stared at the spirits. No, she whispered. She turned once more to the center. I will not leave you. Not for any reason. Though no words have been spoken over us, we are joined in our hearts. By my magic, we are one. What happens to one happens to both. I am staying. Richard didn't look over. He continued to stare at the spirits as they floated in the center of the room above the skulls. She thought he would yell at her to leave. He didn't. His voice came soft and gentle. Thank you. I love you, Kaylin Amnell. Together, then. The door banged closed. Kaylin jumped, and a little sound escaped from her throat before she could catch it. Her heart pounded in her ears. She tried to slow her breathing, but couldn't. She swallowed instead. The image of the spirits dimmed. What you have called forth, Richard Rowl, we cannot stay to witness. We are sorry. Their forms seemed to evaporate as she watched. As they vanished, the light went with them until the two of them were left in total blackness. She could hear the slow crackle of the fire off beyond that blackness, Richard's quick breathing, her own breathing, and nothing else. Richard's hand found hers. In the darkness, they sat together, alone, naked. As Kaylin began to think, to hope, that nothing was going to happen, she became aware of a slight brightening in front of her. There was light beginning to glow. Green light. A shade of green light she had seen from only one place. The underworld. Her breaths came in ragged pulls. The green light brightened, and with it, distant wails. From the air all about came an ear-splitting crack, like a clap of thunder, sudden, hard, painful. The ground shook with the impact of it. From the center of the green light, a white brilliance oozed through to coalesce into a form and stand before them. Her breath caught in her throat. The fine hairs on the back of her neck stood out stiffly. The white form took a step closer. She only dimly realized Richard's grip on her hand was hurting her. Kaylin knew the white robes, the long blonde hair, the painfully handsome face that stood before them, smiling that small, gruesome smile. Dear spirits, protect us, she whispered. It was dark and raw. As one, she and Richard came slowly to their feet. The glowing blue eyes watched them rise. Relaxed, unhurried, Dark and Rawl brought a hand up and licked his fingertips. Thank you, Richard, for calling me back. His cruel smile widened. How thoughtful of you. I didn't call you back, Richard whispered. Dark and Rawl laughed a quiet laugh. Once again, you make a mistake. Call me back, you did. You called a gathering. A gathering of ancestor spirits. I am your ancestor. Only you could have brought me back through the veil. Only you. I denounce you. Denounce me all you will. He held his arms out, out in the white light around him. 
I am still here. But I killed you. The glowing, shimmering, white-robed form laughed again. Killed me? So you did. And you used magic to send me to a different place. A place where I am known. A place where I have friends. And now you have called me back. Again with magic. Not simply called me back, Richard, but torn the veil further to do so. He slowly shook his head. Is there no end to your stupidity? Dark and Rawl seemed to float, and at the same time walk toward Richard. Richard let go of Kaylin's hand as he backed away. She couldn't make her legs move to go with him. Richard's eyes were wide. I killed you. I defeated you. I won. You lost. The blonde head nodded slowly. You won a small battle in a timeless war by using the gift and the wizard's first rule. But in your ignorance, you violated the wizard's second rule, and in so doing, you have lost it all. His slow, wicked smile came back. Such a shame. Didn't anyone ever tell you magic is dangerous? I could have taught you, could have shared it all with you. He shrugged. But it doesn't matter. You have helped me win even without being taught. I couldn't be more proud of you. What is the wizard's second rule? What did I do? Rawl's eyebrows lifted as he took another step closer. Why, Richard, don't you know? You should, he whispered. You have broken it a second time today. And in violating it a second time, you have torn the veil once more a second time and brought me here so that I might tear it the rest of the way and free the keeper. His mocking smile returned. All by yourself, he gave a taunting laugh. My son, you should never have meddled in things you don't understand. What do you want? Raoul drifted closer. You, my son. You. His hand began to rise toward Richard. You sent me to another world, and now in turn I'm going to send you there. You are for the Keeper. He wants you. You are his. Without even realizing it, Kaylin's fist was up, the Kondar igniting in the depths of her being. Rage exploded through her, and blue lightning erupted from her fist. The dark void around them was ripped away in a fury of light and sound that shook the ground under her feet. The spirit house was back, lit by the blue bolt as it arced toward Dark and Rawl. Effortlessly, his hand came up, deflecting the strike. The bolt of lightning split. One shaft blasted through the roof into the black sky, sending a shower of tile fragments raining down. The other fork struck the ground, throwing dirt hurtling everywhere. Dark and Rawl's eyes met hers. His gaze seared her very soul. He smiled the most wicked smile she had ever seen. It seemed to make every fiber of her being ache. She tried to call forth the power again, but nothing happened. He had done something. Kaylin tried, but she couldn't move a muscle. Richard seemed as paralyzed as she. Her world was collapsing in a frightening rush. Richard, she wailed in her mind. My Richard... Oh, dear spirits, don't let this happen. His eyes burning with rage, Richard managed to take a step forward, but Dark and Rawl put his hand to the left side of his chest, above his heart, stopping him stone still. I mark you, Richard, for the keeper, with the keeper's mark. You are his. Richard threw his head back. His scream seemed to rend the very fabric of the air and tear his heart and soul with its despair. Kaylin felt as if she died a thousand deaths in that instant. As Dark and Rawl held his hand to Richard's chest, wisps of smoke curled away, Kaylin's nostrils filled with the stench of burning flesh. Dark and Rawl pulled his hand back. The price of ignorance, Richard. You are marked. You are the keepers now. Now and forever, the journey begins. Richard collapsed like a puppet whose strings had been cut. Kaylin didn't know if he was unconscious or dead. Something held her up, but it wasn't her legs. It was the strings held by Dark and Rawl. 
He glided closer to her. He loomed over her, crushing her in blinding brilliance. Kaylin wanted to shrink away, to close her eyes, but she could not. Finally, she regained her voice. Kill me too, she whispered. Send me where you have sent him, please. His glowing hand reached toward her. The agony in her heart tore her mind senseless. His fingers fanned open. His touch on her flesh sent fire and ice through her in a wave of shock. The hand pulled back. No. Darkenral's pitiless smile spread anew. No, that would be too easy. Better to let him see what happens to you. Better to let him watch, helpless. The smile showed teeth for the first time. Better to let him suffer it. His eyes had an intensity that seemed to impale her. It was the same frightening glare Richard had inherited. You live for now. Soon enough, you will twist in a different pain, living and dead, he whispered in a measured, merciless tone. He will watch forever. I will watch forever. The Keeper will watch forever. Please, she cried, send me with him. A finger reached out and touched a tear. The pain of the touch made her flinch. Since you love him so much, I will give you a gift. He turned and drew his arm smoothly through the air in Richard's direction. His frightening blue eyes returned to her. I will let him live a short time longer. Long enough for you to watch as the keeper's mark bleeds the life from him, bleeds his soul from him. Time is nothing. The keeper will have him. I give you this spark of time in forever to watch the one you love die. He leaned toward her. She struggled to back away, but couldn't. His lips left a kiss on her cheek. The pain of it sent a silent shriek through her and filled her mind with a vision of being raped. Luminous fingers lifted her hair from her neck. His mouth was by her ear. Enjoy my gift, he whispered intimately. In time, I will have you, too, forever, between life and death. Forever. I would like to tell you how much you will suffer, but I am afraid you would not be able to comprehend it. Soon enough, I will show you. He gave a whispering laugh in her ear. After I have torn the veil the rest of the way and freed the keeper. As she stood helpless, he left another kiss on her neck. The horror of the visions it seared through her mind left her feeling defiled beyond anything she had thought possible. Just a tiny taste. Goodbye for now, Mother Confessor. As he turned from her, she was able to move again. She snatched desperately for the power. It wouldn't come. She cried and shook as she watched him glide through the doorway of the spirit house and disappear. And then she collapsed to the ground with a wail of agony. Convulsing in ragged sobs, she clawed across the dirt to Richard. He lay on his side, away from her. She pulled him over on his back. His arm flopped to his side, limp. His head rolled toward her. He looked ashen, dead. On his chest was a burned handprint, the keeper's mark. The blackened skin was cracked and bleeding. His life, his soul, was bleeding away. She fell on him, clutched at him, as she wept and shook uncontrollably. Kalin gripped her fingers into a fist in his hair and pressed her face against his cold cheek. Please, Richard, she cried in choking sobs. Please don't leave me. I would do anything for you. I would die in your place. Don't die. Don't leave me. Please, Richard, don't die. She crouched against him, her world ending, dying. She could think of nothing to do other than cry that she loved him. He was dying, and she could do nothing to stop it. She could feel his breathing slow. She willed herself to die with him, but death wouldn't come. She lost all sense of time. She didn't know if she had been there a few minutes or a few hours. She didn't know what was real anymore. It all felt like a nightmare. With trembling fingers, she stroked his face. His skin was dead cold. You would be Kalen. She spun around, sitting up at the sound of the woman's voice coming from behind her. 
the door to the spirit house was closed again. In the darkness, a white, spirit-like glow towered over her. It appeared to be a spirit, a woman, her hands clasped in front of her. She watched with a pleasant smile. Her hair, as best as Kalen could make of it, was plaited in a single braid. Who are you? The figure sank down to sit in front of her. The spirit had no clothes Kalen could make out, but didn't appear to be naked either. The woman looked at Richard. A glaze of both longing and anguish came over her fair features. The spirit turned to Kalen. I am Denna. The shock of the name and her proximity to Richard brought Kalen's fist up in a jerk. Lightning screamed to be released. Before Kalen could let it go, Denna spoke again. He is dying. He needs us, both of us. Kalen hesitated. You can help him? We both can, maybe, if you love him enough. Kalen's hopes flared. I would do anything, anything. Denna nodded. I hope so. Denna looked back to Richard and tenderly stroked his chest. Kalen was a blink away from releasing the power. She didn't know if Denna was trying to hurt him or help him. She hoped against hope. This was her only chance to save Richard. Richard took a deep breath. Kalen's heart leapt. Denna withdrew her hand and smiled. He is still with you. Kalen lowered her fist a little and wiped tears from her cheek with the fingers of her other hand. She didn't like the look of longing Denna had as she watched Richard, not one bit. How did you get here? Richard couldn't have called you. You are not his ancestor. Denna turned, her small, dreamy smile fading. It would be impossible to relate it to you accurately, but perhaps I could explain it enough that it would help you to understand. I was in a place of darkness and peace. It was disturbed as Dark and Rahl passed through. His passing through is something that is not supposed to happen. As he neared, I sensed that Richard had somehow called him and enabled him to pass from where he was, held by a veil, and to come here. I know Dark and Rahl all too well, and I knew what he would do to Richard. So I followed him. I would never have been able to pass through my own veil, but by latching on to him I was able to come through, too, to follow in his wake. I came because I knew what Dark and Rahl would do to Richard. I don't know how to explain it better. Kalen nodded. She wasn't seeing a spirit. She was seeing a woman who had taken Richard as her mate. The power boiled angrily inside her. She struggled to put it down, telling herself that this was to save Richard. She didn't know any other way. She had to let Denna help, if she could. Kalen had said she would do anything, and she meant it even if it was not to try to kill someone who was already dead, someone she wanted to kill a thousand times and then another thousand. Can you help him? Can you save him? The keeper's mark has been placed upon him. The mark will take the holder to the keeper. If another's hand is placed over the mark, it will transfer to them and take them instead in his place. Richard will not then be pulled to the keeper. He will live. Kayla knew in that instant what she must do. Without hesitation, she leaned over Richard, stretching her hand out. Then I will take the mark. I will go in his place so that he will live. She spread her fingers to match the black mark. Her hand was only a scant inch above it. Kaylin, don't do that. She looked over her shoulder. Why? If it will save him, then I am willing to go in his place. I know you are, but it is not that simple. We must talk first. It will not be easy for either of us. It will hurt both of us to really help him. Kalen reluctantly sat back down and nodded. She would have agreed to anything, paid any price, even talking to this woman. She put a hand protectively on Richard as she sat facing Denna. How do you know who I am? Denna grinned, almost laughed. To know Richard is to know who Kalen is. He told you about me? Denna's smile faded. In a way, I heard your name countless times. When I hurt him, until he was delirious, he cried your name, never another, not his mother's, nor his father's, only yours. I hurt him until he didn't know his own name, but he always knew yours. I knew he would find a way to be with you despite your confessor's power. A little of her smile came back. I think Richard could find a way to make the sun rise at midnight. Why are you telling me this? 
because I am going to ask you to help him, and I want you to understand exactly how much you will be hurting him before you agree to it. You must understand what it is you will have to do in order to save him. I won't trick you into doing it. It must be with your full knowledge. Only in that way will you know how to save him. If you don't understand, you could fail. He is in danger from more than this mark. He is sick with a madness. Madness I put there. It will kill him as surely as will the keeper's mark. Richard is probably the most sane person I know. He has no madness. It is the mark we must remove. He is marked in other ways. He has the gift. I knew from the moment he came to kill me. I can see it in him now, the aura of it. I know it is killing him, and I know his time is very short. I don't know how long, only that there is not much time left. We can't save him from the keeper, just to have him die anyway from the gift. Kaylin nodded as she wiped her nose on the back of her hand. The Sisters of the Light say they can save him. They say he must put a collar on to save himself. Richard will not put it on. He told me what you did to him, why he won't wear a collar. But Richard is not crazy. He will see in the end what must be done and do it. That is the way he is. He will see the truth. Denna shook her head. What he told you does not scratch the surface of it. You cannot imagine what he has not told you. I know his madness. He will not tell you the rest of it. I must. Kalin's anger boiled. I don't think it would be wise for you to tell me. If he doesn't want to tell me, then I don't think I should know it. You must. You must understand him if you are to help him. In some ways, I understand him better than you. I have taken him to the edge of madness and beyond. I have seen him in a wasteland of insanity. I have stood over him and held him there. Kalin glared. She recognized the look in Denna's eyes when she looked at Richard. She didn't trust her. You love him. Denna stared at her. He loves you. I used that love to hurt him. I took him to the brink of death and held him there on the cusp. Others would bring a man to the edge faster, but they couldn't hold him there. They always went one step too far too quickly and killed them, ending it before they could extract the most exquisite pain, inflict the cruelest of the insanity. Dark and Rawl chose me because I had a talent for keeping them alive and giving them that pain, and then more, and then even more. Dark and Rawl himself taught me. I had to sit for hours sometimes and wait, knowing that if I touched him just once more with the Aegeal, it would be one touch too many. It would kill him. As I sat, waiting for him to recover enough so that I might hurt him more, he would whisper your name over and over for hours. He wasn't even aware he was doing it. You were the thread that kept him alive. It was the one thread that allowed me to give him that extra pain, allowed me to take him further toward death, deeper into madness. I used his love for you to punish him beyond anything otherwise possible. As I would sit there, listening to him whisper your name, I wished it would once, just once, have been my name, he called out. It never was. I hurt him more for that than for anything else. Tears ran down Kaylin's cheeks, falling from her face. Please, Denna, I don't want to hear any more. I can't bear to hear any more, to know I made it possible for you to do what you did. You must. I have not yet even begun to tell you what you must hear if you want to help him. You must understand how I used magic against him. Why he hates the magic within himself, I understand because what I did to him was also done to me by Dark and Rahl. As Kalin sat shaking, staring blankly at nothing, almost in a trance, Denna began telling her what she had done to Richard, how she used the Aegeal. She flinched at the description of every kind of touch and everything it could do. Kalin remembered all too well what its touch felt like, the maddening pain. She learned that what she had felt was the least of it. She cried as Denna told her how Richard had hung in shackles as she pulled his head back by his hair and made him stay perfectly still while she pushed the Aegeal in his ear or risked damage inside his head, and how he had been able to do it because of his love for Kalin. She shook when she heard the horrifying description of what it did to him, what the magic did to him, what his own magic did to him. She couldn't look at Denna as the other spoke, couldn't meet her eyes, and that was only the beginning. She clutched her stomach and held a trembling hand to her mouth to keep from vomiting. 
as Denna described one unspeakable act after another. Kaylin couldn't make herself stop crying. She gagged as she closed her eyes tight. As she listened, she prayed to the good spirits that Denna wouldn't tell her the one thing she knew she couldn't bear to hear. But then Denna told her. Told her what a moored Sith did to her mate, why their mates didn't live long, every intimate detail, and what she had done to Richard that she had done to no other mate. With a wail, Kaylin turned away, crawled a short distance, and started throwing up. With one hand holding herself up and the other across her abdomen, she cried and heaved and gagged. Then his hands were there holding her hair back as Kaylin emptied the contents of her stomach onto the dirt. She vomited until her insides were heaved dry. She felt Denna's warm, tingling touch on her back. She wanted to call forth the lightning, but was too sick to find the power. She was torn between wanting to throw herself on Richard and comfort him and ripping this woman apart with the magic of the Kondar, the blood rage. Between gagging and panting and crying, Kalen managed to get the words out, Take your hands off me. The hand holding her hair slipped away. The one on her back lifted. Her stomach heaved again in a dry convulsion. How many times did you do that to him? Enough. It does not matter. Kalen turned in a rage, clenching her fists as she screamed. How many times? Denna's voice was soft and calm. I'm sorry, Kalen. I don't know. I didn't keep a tally. But he was with me a long time, longer than any other mate. I did it almost every night. The things I did, I did to no other, because none had the strength Richard did, the strength of his love for you. The others would have died the first time. He fought me for a long time. I did it enough, that's all. Enough. Enough? Enough for what? Enough to drive a part of him mad. He's not mad. He's not. He's not. Denna watched as Kalen shook with pain and rage. Kalen, listen to me. Anyone else would have been broken by what I did. Richard saved himself by partitioning his mind. He locked the core of himself away where I couldn't get to it, where the magic couldn't get to it. He used the gift to do that. It saved the core of himself from the insanity. But in the darkest corners of his mind lurks madness. I used his magic against him to drive him insane. He couldn't protect all of himself from the things I did. I told you what I did so you could see the truth of his madness. He had to sacrifice that part to save the rest, to save the rest for you. I wish I could have done the same when it was done to me. Kalen lifted Richard's hand in hers, holding the back of it to her heart. How could you do those things? She cried. Oh, my poor Richard. How could you? How could you do that to anyone? We all have our own little bits of insanity, some more than others. My life was a darkness of it. Then how could you? How could you, knowing what it was like? Denna watched her from under her eyebrows. You have done terrible things, too. You have used your power to hurt people. But they were people guilty of horrible crimes. All of them? She asked quietly. Everyone? Kalen's breath caught with the memory of using her power against Brophy. No, she whispered. But I didn't do it because I wanted to. I had to. It is my job, who I am, what I am. But you did it. And what of Demin Nas? The words cut through her. Her mind flooded with the memory, the sweet memory of castrating that beast of a man. She sank forward with a wail. Oh, dear spirits, am I no better than you? We all do what we must, whatever the reasons. Her glowing, diaphanous fingers lifted Kalen's chin. I do not tell you these things to hurt you, Kalen. The telling of them wounds me more than you can know. I tell you because I want to save Richard so that he doesn't die before his rightful time and so that the Keeper does not escape. Kalen clutched Richard's hand tighter to her breast as she wept. I'm sorry, Denna, but I don't have it in me to forgive you. I know Richard does, but I do not. I hate you. I would not expect you to forgive me. I only wish you to understand the truth of what I am telling you, the truth of Richard's madness. Why? To what purpose? so that you will understand what you must do. Wearing a collar is the core of that insanity. It symbolizes everything I did to him. In his mind, magic is madness, torture. A collar is madness, torture, insanity. 
The thought of having a collar around his neck brings that madness out of the darkest corners of his being, brings out his deepest fears. He is not exaggerating when he says he would rather die than put a collar around his neck. He will not do it to save himself. If he doesn't, he will die. There is only one thing in the world that will make him put on the collar. Kalin's head snapped up. Her eyes were wide. You want me to ask him to put a collar around his neck? She went weak with dread. You would have me do that to him? After what you have told me? Denna nodded. He will do it if you tell him. He will not do it for any other reason. None. Richard's limp arm slipped from Kalin's shaking hands. Her fingers covered her mouth. Denna was right. After what she knew now, what she had heard, she knew Denna was right. She knew now what it had been that she had seen in Richard's eyes when he looked at the collar the sisters held out to him. It had been madness. Richard would never put a collar around his neck of his own accord. Never. She knew that now. Really knew it. A small cry escaped her throat. If I make him put on the collar, he will think I have betrayed him. In his madness, he will think I want to hurt him. Pain welled up inside her, and she started to cry all over again. He will hate me. Denna's voice came in a soft whisper. I am sorry, Kalin. That could be the truth of it. We can't know for sure, but he may very well see it that way. I don't know how much the madness will take over when he knows he must put on the collar when you tell him he must. But he loves you more than life itself and will put it on for no other reason. Denna, I don't know if I could do that to him, not after what you have told me. You must, or he will die. If you love him enough, you must do this. You must be strong enough in your love for him to force him to do it, knowing the pain it will bring him. You may have to act as I would have acted, to frighten him enough to do as you say. You may have to bring the madness to full flower, make him think the way he did when he was with me, when he would have done anything he was told. You may lose his love. He may hate you forever. But if you really love him, you will see that you are the only one who can help him, the only one who can save him. Kalin snatched desperately for a way out. But in the morning, we were going to go to Zed, a wizard who might be able to help him control the gift. Richard thinks Zed will know what to do, that he will be able to help him. That may be true. I'm sorry, Kalin. I don't know the answer to that. It may work. But I do know that the Sisters of Light have the power to save him. If they come and he turns them down for the third time, he will forever lose the opportunity to get their help. If it turns out that this wizard can't help Richard, then he will die. His time is short, days at most. Do you understand what that means, Kalin? He won't just die. The Keeper will have him, have everyone. Richard is the only one who can close the veil. How? Do you know how he can close it? I'm sorry, I don't. I know only that it must be torn the rest of the way from this side. That is why the Keeper has agents on this side. That is why Dark and Rahl came here. Somehow Richard is the only one who can stop them, and also the only one with the power to repair what has been rent. If he turns the sisters down, and this wizard can't help him, then he dies, soon. And it will be as if the mark itself took him to the Keeper. If he can get to this wizard before he turns the sisters down for the third time, he can learn whether he can be helped without them, without the collar. But if they come before he can get to Zed, I must have your promise you will do what must be done to save him. There is time. The sisters won't be back for at least a few days. We can get to Zed first. There is time. I hope you are right. I really do. I'm sure you won't believe me. But I don't want Richard to ever have to wear a collar, to ever face that madness again. But if you can't get to Zed, then you must promise me you won't allow him to miss the chance at life the sisters offer. Tears streamed from Kalin's burning eyes. Richard would hate her if she made him put on the collar. She knew he would. He would think she had betrayed him. But what of the mark? He still has the mark on him. Denna watched her a long time. Her voice came so softly, Kalin could scarcely hear it. I will take the mark. I will go to the keeper in his place. A shimmering tear ran down her cheek. But I will only do it. I will only give up my soul 
if I know it gives him a chance. Kalin stared incredulously. You would do that for him? She whispered. Why? Because after all I had done to him, he cared about my pain. He is the only one who ever did anything to stop my pain. When Dark and Rahl beat me, he cried, and he made a potion to take away my pain, though I had never once stopped torturing him, no matter how much he begged. Not once. And after all the things I have told you I did to him, he forgave me. He understood what I had suffered. He took my Aegeal to wear around his neck and promised to remember me, to remember that I was more than a moored Sith, to remember that I was once just Dena. Another shimmering tear ran down. And because I love him, even in death I love him, though I know my love will never be requited, I still love him. Kalin looked at Richard as he lay on his back, unconscious, helpless, with the keeper's mark black and bleeding on his chest. The black and white mud painted everywhere on him made him look wild, savage. But he wasn't. He was the gentlest person she had ever known. She realized then that she would do anything to save him. Anything. I will do it, she whispered. I promise. If we can't find Zed before the sisters come back for the third time, I will make him put on the collar, no matter what it takes. Even if it makes him hate me. Even if it kills me. Denna's hand reached out to her. An oath, then, between the living and the dead, to do what must be done to save him? Kalin stared at the hand before her. I still can't forgive you. I won't forgive you. The hand stayed where it was, waiting. The only forgiveness I need has already been granted. Kalin stared at the hand, and then reached out and took it. An oath, then, to save the one we love. They clasped hands and shared a silent joining. Denna took away her hand. Time is short for him. It must be now, Kalin nodded. When it is done, get help for him. Though the pull of the mark will be removed, the wound will still be there, and it is a serious one. Kalin nodded. There is a healer here. She will help him. Denna's eyes were filled with compassion. Thank you, Kalin, for loving him enough to help him. May the good spirits be with you both. She gave a small, frightened smile. Where I am going, I will never see any of them or I would send them to help you. Kalin touched the back of the other's hand, offering a silent prayer for strength. Denna returned the touch to Kalin's cheek and then knelt next to Richard. Her hand went to the mark, covering it, dissolving into it. Richard's chest heaved. Denna's features twisted in pain. She threw her head back with a piercing scream that shot through Kalin. And then she was just gone. Richard groaned. Kalin bent over him, caressing him crying. Kalen, he moaned. Kalen, what happened? It hurts. It hurts so. Lie still, my love. Everything is all right. You are safe with me. I'll get help. He nodded, and she ran to the door, throwing it open. The elders were sitting in a small circle in the dark just outside the door. They looked up expectantly. Help me, she screamed. Carry him to Nissel. There's no time to get her. Chapter 17 when he stirred, Kalin lifted her head. His gray eyes blinked and searched around the small room until they found her face. Where are we? She gave his shoulder a little squeeze. At Nissel's. She tended your burn. His right hand came up and touched the bandage-covered poultice. He winced. How long? What time is it? Kalin looked up from where she was crouched on the floor next to him, rubbed her eyes and squinted out the partly open door at the gray light. It has been light for an hour or two. Nissel is in the back room, sleeping. She was up most of the night tending your wound. The elders are all outside watching over you. They haven't left since we brought you here. When? When did you bring me here? In the middle of the night. Richard looked around again. What happened? Dark and Rahl was there. His big hand grasped her arm. He touched me. He marked me. Where did he go? What happened after he touched me? She shook her head. I don't know. He just left. His hand squeezed her arm painfully. His eyes were wild. What do you mean he left? Did he go back into the green light? Back into the underworld? She pulled at his fingers. Richard, you're hurting me. He let go. I'm sorry. He cradled her head to his good shoulder. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. He let out a noisy breath. I can't believe how stupid I am. 
She kissed his neck. It didn't hurt that much. That's not what I mean. I mean I can't believe how stupid I was to call him back from the underworld. I can't believe I did something that stupid. I was warned. I should have thought. I should have figured it out. I let myself focus on one thing so strongly that I didn't look around and see what was coming from a different direction. I must be mad to have done that. Don't say that, she whispered. You're not mad. She pushed herself up and looked down at him. Don't you ever say that about yourself. Page 187. He blinked, then pushed himself up to sit facing her. He winced when he touched the bandage again. He reached out to run his hand down her cheek, through her hair. He smiled the smile that made her heart melt. He sought her eyes. You are the most beautiful woman in the world. Did I ever tell you that? All the time. Well, you are. I love your green eyes, your hair. You have the most beautiful hair I ever saw. Kaylin, I love you more than anything in the world. She forced herself to hold back tears. I love you more than anything else, too. Please, Richard, promise me you won't ever doubt my love. Promise me that no matter what happens, you won't ever doubt how much I love you. He cupped her cheek. I promise. I promise I will never doubt your love, no matter what. All right? What's the matter? She leaned against him, laid her head on his shoulder, and wrapped her arms carefully around him so as not to hurt him. Dark and Rawl frightened me. That's all. I was so afraid when he burned you with his hand. I thought you were dead. He stroked her shoulder. So what happened? I remember him telling me how he got here, because I called him and he was my ancestor. And then he said something about marking me for the keeper. Then I don't remember anything else. What happened? Kalen's mind raced. Well, he said he was going to mark you, kill you, that the mark would send you to the keeper. He said he was here to tear the veil the rest of the way. He put his hand against you, burned you. But before he could do it enough, before he could kill you, I called the lightning, the Kondar. He missed a breath. I don't suppose that we could be lucky enough that it killed him or destroyed him or whatever it is that can be done to a spirit. She shook her head. No, it didn't destroy him. He was able to block it, partly anyway. But I think it frightened him. He left. Not back into the green light, but out the door. Before he could finish what he was going to do to you, he just left. That's all. He grinned and hugged her tighter. My heroine, you saved me. He was quiet a moment. Here to tear the veil, he whispered to himself. His brow was set in a thoughtful frown. And then what happened? Kaylin steeled herself for the lie of omission, but she couldn't bear the scrutiny of his eyes. She nestled her face against his shoulder, frantically trying to think of a way to get him off the subject. And then the elders and I carried you here so Nissel could tend to your burn. She said that it's bad, but that the poultice will make it well. You have to leave it on for a few days until it begins to heal over enough. She angrily shook a finger at him. I know you. You will want to take it off sooner. You always think you know best. Well, you don't. You will just leave it on like I tell you, Richard Cipher. His smile faded a little. Richard Rawl. She stared at him. I'm sorry, she whispered. Richard Rawl. She forced a smile. My Richard. Maybe you could change it when we're married. You could be Richard Amnell. Mates to confessors sometimes take their wife's family name. He grinned. I like it. Richard Amnell, husband to the mother confessor. Devoted husband. Loving husband. The haunted look returned to his eyes. Sometimes I fear I don't know who or what I am. Sometimes I think you are part of me and I am part of you. That's all that is important. He nodded absently, his eyes glistening with tears. I wanted to help with a gathering. I wanted to find a way to stop all this. Instead, as Dark and Rawl said, I've only made it worse. He was right. I am stupid. It's going to be my fault. Richard, stop it. You've been hurt. You're just exhausted. When you've rested, you'll figure it out. You'll know what to do. He gave himself a mental shake. He threw the blanket off and looked down. Who washed the mud off me and dressed me? The elders washed off the mud. 
Nissel and I were going to dress you, she said, as his face turned red. But you were too big and heavy for us. The elders did that, too. They had quite a time of it. It took all of them. He nodded absently. He had stopped listening. He reached up to the spot on his chest where the whistle, Scarlet's tooth, and the Aegeal usually hung, but didn't find them. We have to get out of here. We have to get to Zed. Right now, before anything else happens. I need Zed's help. Where is Scarlet's tooth? I have to call her. Where's my sword? All of our things are in the spirit house. He scrubbed his hands over his face, thinking, then combed his fingers through his hair. All right. His solid gaze came to her eyes. I'll go get the tooth and call Scarlet and get our things together. Get them ready to leave. He gently squeezed her upper arm. You go to Wesselon and put on your wedding dress. While we wait for Scarlet to come, we can be married. We'll leave when Scarlet gets here. He kissed her cheek. We will be married and we'll be in Aiden Drill with Zed before dark. Everything will be all right. You'll see. Everything will be all right. I'll find out what I did wrong and fix it. I promise. She put her arms around his neck. We will fix it, she corrected. Together, always together. He laughed quietly in her ear. Together. I need you. You light my way. She slipped away from him and looked at him sternly. Well, I have instructions for you, and you are going to do as you are told. You are going to wait here until Nissel says you can get up. She said that when you wake, she has to change the poultice and bandage and give you medicine. You are going to stay here until she is finished, understand? I don't want you getting sick and dying on me now, not after I have gone to all the trouble of saving you, and a great deal of trouble it was. I'll go to Wesselon so she can finish fitting my dress. When Nissel is finished with you, then, she shook a finger at him, and only then may you leave to go call Scarlet. When you are finished here with Nissel, and when you have called Scarlet and gotten our things together, come get me and I will marry you. She kissed the end of his nose if you also promise to love me always. Always, he said with a grin. She rested her wrists on his shoulders to each side of his strong neck and clasped her hands together behind his head. I'll wake Nissel and ask her to hurry with you, but please, Richard, don't waste any time after that. Call Scarlet quickly, quick as you can. I want to get away from here. I want to get away before Sister Verna even comes close. I don't want to take any chances, even if she isn't supposed to be back for a few days. I want us away from here, away from the Sisters of the Light. I want to get you to Zed so he can help you with the headaches before they can get any worse. He gave her a boyish, lopsided smile. What about your big bed in Aiden Drill? Don't you want to get to that in a hurry, too? With a finger, she gently squashed his nose flat. I've never had anyone else in my big bed before. I hope I don't disappoint you. He gripped her waist in his strong hands and pulled her to him hard enough to make her grunt. He pushed her hair back off her neck and gave it a tender kiss, right where Darken Rawl's lips had been. Disappoint me? That, my love, is the only thing in the world it would be impossible for you to do. He gave her neck one more tickling kiss. Now go get Nissel. We are wasting time. Kaylin pulled on the fabric, trying to bring it up as much as she could. I've never worn anything cut this low. You don't think it shows too much? Wesselon looked up from the floor where she was fussing with the hem of the blue dress. She took the fine bone needle from her mouth as she rose to appraise her client's fit. She studied the expanse of flesh a moment. You don't think he will like it? Kalen felt her face flush. Well, I think he will, I hope so, but Wesselon leaned a little closer. If you are worried about him seeing that much, perhaps you had better reconsider this. Kalen lifted an eyebrow. He's not the only one who will be looking. I've never worn anything like this before. I'm worried that I don't do it justice. Wesselon smiled and patted Kalen's arm. You wear that dress well. It looks beautiful on you. It's perfect. Kalen still fretted as she glanced down at herself. Really? Are you sure? I fill it out properly? Wesselon's smile widened. Really? You have fine breasts. Everyone says so. Kaylin felt her face redden. She was sure of the truth of the casual statement. Among the mud people, commenting favorably on a woman's breasts in public was no more odd than a man elsewhere telling a woman she had a pleasant smile. It was an uninhibited attitude that more than once had caught her off guard. 
Kalen held the skirt out to the sides. It's the most beautiful dress I've ever worn, Wesselon. Thank you for all your hard work. I will treasure it always. Maybe someday, if you have a daughter, she will wear it when she weds. Kalen smiled and nodded. Please, dear spirits, she was thinking. If a child comes, let it be a daughter and not a son. She reached up and touched the delicate necklace she wore, her fingers turning the small round bone strung among a few red and yellow beads. Addie, the bone woman, had given her the necklace to protect her from the beasts that dwelt in the past through the boundary that at the time had separated Westland from the Midlands. The old woman had told her it would help protect her child one day. Kalen dearly loved the necklace. It was just like the one her mother had received from Addie and had in turn given to Kalen. Kalen had buried it with her closest childhood friend, Denis. Since Denis's death, she had missed her mother's necklace. This one was all the more special because the night before they had gone through the pass, Richard had added his oath to the necklace to protect any future child she might have. Neither she nor Richard had suspected at the time that there was any way that child might possibly be his. I hope so. Wesselon, will you stand with me? Stand with you? Kalen pulled some of her hair self-consciously over her half-exposed chest. Where I come from, it is the custom to have a friend stand by you when you wed, to stand as a representative of the good spirits watching over the joining. Richard would like Savidlin to stand with him. I would like it if you stood by me. That seems a strange custom. The good spirits always watch over us. But if it is your custom, I would be honored to be the one who stands by you. Kalen beamed. Thank you. Now, stand up straight. I am almost finished. Wesselon again bent to her task at the hem. Kalen tried to stand with her back straight. It hurt from sitting on the floor next to Richard the last half of the night. She wished she could sit or lie down. She was that sleepy, but mostly her back hurt. Suddenly, she wondered how much Denna was hurting right now. She didn't care, she told herself. Whatever was happening to her would never be enough after what she had done to Richard. Her stomach lurched at the memory of what Denna had told her. Kalen could still feel the place on her neck where Dark and Rawl had put his lips. A shiver ran up her spine at the memory. She remembered the mask of agony on Denna's face the instant before she disappeared. It didn't matter. She deserved it. It could have been Richard, though. If it hadn't been for Denna, it could have been Richard. Don't be afraid, Kalen. What? She focused her eyes. Wesselon was standing in front of her, smiling. I'm sorry, what did you say? Wesselon reached out and wiped a tear from Kalen's cheek. I said not to be afraid. Richard is a good man. You will have a happy life with him. It is natural to fear being wedded, but do not worry. It will be fine. You will see. I cried too before I wedded my Savidlin. I didn't think I would because I wanted him so, but I found myself crying just like you. She winked. I never had reason to cry again. Sometimes I find reason to complain, but never to cry. Kalen wiped the other cheek. What was the matter with her? She didn't care what was happening to Denna. She didn't, not one bit. She nodded to Wesselon and forced a smile. That would be my greatest hope in life, never to cry again. Wesselon gave her a comforting hug. Would you like something to eat? No, I'm not... Savidlin came bursting through the door. He was sweating and panting. Kalen went cold with fright at the look on his face. She started shaking even before his words came. When Nissel finished with Richard, I went with him to the spirit house like you told me to, so he could call the dragon. The sister of the light came for him. She is there with him. I didn't understand his words, but I knew their meaning and your name. He wanted me to come for you. Hurry. No, Kalen wailed as she shot past him and out through the doorway. As she ran, she held the hem of her dress up in her fists so she wouldn't trip on it. She had never run so fast. Her breath couldn't keep pace as she raced down the narrow passageways. Her hair streamed behind her as she ran. The winter air was frigid on her skin. The sound of Savidlin running behind her faded away. She couldn't form a thought except that she must get to Richard. This couldn't be happening. It was too soon. The sister shouldn't be here. The two of them were leaving, almost gone. It wasn't fair at all. Richard. Big white snowflakes drifted down, not enough to turn the ground white, but enough to bring an icy foreboding of the winter that was coming, the winter 
that was here. The wet flakes melted instantly as they touched her hot skin. Some caught in her lashes until she blinked them away. A light breeze curled around a corner, swirling into a white curtain. Kaylin flew through it and down a passageway. She skidded to a stop and looked around. It was the wrong way. She ran back and took the correct turn. Tears ran down her face with the melted snowflakes. It was too much. It couldn't be. Panting and desperate, she broke from the buildings into the clearing around the spirit house. The sisters' horses were tethered on the other side of the short wall, the wall with the gash through it from when Richard had tried to kill the Screeling. People were standing around, but she didn't see them. Everything except the door to the spirit house grayed in her vision. She ran desperately for it. It took forever, as if she were running in a dream and couldn't make any headway. Her legs ached with the strain. Her hand stretched for the latch. Her heart pounded in her ears. Please, dear spirits, she begged. Don't let me be too late. Grunting through gritted teeth, she yanked the door open and threw herself through. Kaylin jerked to a halt. She gulped air. Richard stood before Sister Verna, beneath the hole ripped through the roof by the lightning. The two of them stood in a shaft of gray light in the gently drifting snowflakes floating down. The rest of the room dimmed into darkness around them. At his hip, Richard's sword glinted in the light. He didn't have the tooth or whistle or a geel around his neck. He hadn't had time to call Scarlet yet. In one hand, Sister Verna was holding the collar out to him. Her gaze went to Kaelin in silent warning for a moment, and then slid back to Richard. You have heard the three reasons for the Radahan. This is your last chance to be helped, Richard. Will you accept the offer? Richard left the sister's steady gaze and turned slowly toward Kaelin, toward where she stood panting. His bright gray eyes followed down her dress and came back up to her face. His voice was gentle, reverent. Kaelin, that dress is beautiful. Beautiful. Kaelin couldn't find her voice. Her heart was pounding, breaking. Sister Verna spoke his name in a tone of serious warning. For the first time, Kaelin saw that Sister Verna held something in her other hand. It was the silver knife. But she wasn't pointing it at herself. It was held toward Richard. Kaelin knew if he didn't accept she intended to kill him. He didn't even seem to be aware of the knife as it flashed in the dim light. Kalen wondered if she had used a spell to block it from his vision. Richard turned back to the sister. You have done your best. You have tried your best. It is not enough. I told you before, I will not... Richard! Kalen took another step toward him as he turned to the sound of her shriek. Her eyes locked on his. Richard, she whispered as she took another step. Her voice broke. Accept the offer. Take the collar. Please. Sister Verna didn't move. She watched calmly. Richard frowned a little. What? Kaelin, you don't understand. I told you, I won't. Richard! He fell silent as he looked at her in puzzlement. She glanced at the sister, standing motionless, the knife still in her hand. She watched as Kaelin stepped closer. Their eyes met. Kaelin knew. The other would wait to see what would happen. There was a hardness in those eyes that spoke of what she was prepared to do if Kaelin didn't change Richard's mind. Richard, listen carefully to me. I want you to accept the offer. His frown deepened. What? Take the collar. His eyes flashed anger. I told you before, I will not. You said you loved me. Kaelin, what's the matter with you? You know I love... She cut him off. Then you will accept the offer. If you really love me, you will take the collar and put it on for me. He stared at her in disbelief. For you? Kalen, I can't. I won't. You will. She was being too gentle and knew it. It was only confusing him. She had to be stronger. She had to act more like Denna if she was to save him. Dear spirits, she begged in her mind, please give me the strength to do this, to save him. Kalen, I don't know what's gotten into you. We can talk about it later. You know how much I love you, but I'm not going to... She clenched her hands into fists and screamed at him. If you love me, you will. Don't stand there and tell me you love me if you aren't willing to prove it. You disgust me. He blinked in surprise. The way his voice sounded made her ache. Kalen, you aren't worthy of my love if you aren't willing to prove it. How dare you say you love me? His eyes were filling with tears, with madness with the memory of what Denna had done to him. 
He sank slowly to his knees. Kalen, please. She leaned over him as she held out clenched fists. Don't you dare talk back to me. His arms flinched up, covering his head. He thought she was going to strike him. He really thought she was going to strike him. Her heart felt as if it ripped. Tears streamed down her face as she let the rage loose. I told you to take the collar. How dare you talk back to me? If you love me, you will take it. Kalen, please, he cried. Don't do this. You don't understand. Don't ask me to. I understand perfectly well, she screamed. I understand that you say you love me, but I don't believe you. I don't believe you. You're lying to me. Your love for me is a lie if you won't take the collar. A lie. A filthy lie. He couldn't look up at her. Look up at her as she stood over him in the blue dress she was to wed him in. He struggled to get the words out as he fixed his eyes on the ground. It's not... It's not a lie. Please, Kalen, I love you. You mean more to me than anything in the world. Please believe me. I would do anything for you. But please... Dying inside, she grabbed a fistful of his hair and jerked his head up, making him look at her. Madness danced in his eyes. He was gone, but only for now, she prayed. Please, dear spirits, only for now. Words, that's all you offer me, not love, not proof, just words, worthless words. As she held him by his hair, she drew her other hand back to slap him. His eyes winced shut. She couldn't make herself do it. She couldn't hit him. It was all she could do just to stay on her feet, not to fall to her knees and throw her arms around him and tell him how much she loved him, that everything was all right. But it wasn't all right. If he didn't do this, he would die. She was the only one who could save him, even if it killed her. Don't hit me anymore, he whispered. Please, Denna. Don't. Kalen swallowed back the wail that tried to escape her throat and made herself speak. Look at me. He did as she ordered. I'm not going to tell you again, Richard. If you love me, you will accept the offer and put on the collar. If you don't, I will make you regret disobeying me more than anything you have ever regretted in your life. Do it now, or it's over. Everything is over. His eyes faltered. She gritted her teeth. I'm not going to tell you again, my pet. Put on the collar. Now. Kalen knew. Knew that my pet was what Denna had called him. Denna had told her with the rest of it. She knew what those two words meant to him. She had hoped she wouldn't have to use them. Whatever link he had to sanity dissolved in that instant. She saw it in his eyes, the thing she feared more than death. Betrayal. She released her grip on his hair as on his knees he turned to Sister Verna. She lifted the collar a little, holding it out to him. It looked dull, gray, dead in the cold light. Richard stared at it. Snowflakes drifted down in the still, quiet light. Expressionless, Sister Verna watched him. All right, he whispered. His shaking hand reached for the collar. His fingers touched it, curled around it. I accept the offer. I accept the collar. Then put it around your neck, Sister Verna said in a soft voice, and close it. He turned to Kalen. I would do anything for you, he whispered. Kalen wanted to die. His hands shook so much, she thought he might drop the collar as he took it from Sister Verna. He held it, staring at it. But then his hands stopped shaking. He took a deep breath and put the collar around his neck. It closed with a snap, and the seam disappeared, leaving a smooth ring of metal. The shaft of light dimmed, as if to twilight, even though it was still day. Deep, ominous thunder rumbled in every direction out across the grasslands. It didn't sound like any thunder Kalen had ever heard before. She could feel it in the ground beneath her feet. She thought that maybe it had something to do with the magic of the collar, something to do with the sisters. She knew when she glanced at Sister Verna and saw her eyes glide around that it wasn't. Richard smoothly rose to his feet before the sister. You may find, Sister Verna, that holding the leash to this collar is worse than wearing it. He gritted his teeth. Much worse. Sister Verna's voice remained calm. We only want to help you, Richard. He nodded slightly. I take nothing on faith. You will have to prove it. In a panic, a sudden thought came to Kalen. What is the third reason? What is the third reason for the collar? 
Richard turned to her with a glare that even his father could not have matched. For a moment, she forgot how to breathe. The first reason is to control the headaches and open my mind so that I may be taught to use the gift. The second reason is to control me. His hand came up and grabbed her by the throat. His eyes sliced through her. The third reason is to give me pain. She closed her eyes with a wail. No, dear spirits, no! He released her throat. His expression went slack, lost. I hope I have proven my love for you, Kalen. I hope you believe me now. I have given you everything. I hope it is enough. I have nothing else to offer. Nothing. You have more than you could ever realize. I love you more than anything in the world, Richard. She reached out to touch his cheek. He pushed her hand away. His eyes said it all. She had betrayed him. Do you? He looked away. I would like to believe you. She tried to swallow the painful, burning lump in her throat. You promised me you would never doubt my love. He nodded slightly. So I did. If she could have called lightning down on herself, she would have done it. Richard, I know you don't understand right now, but I only did what I had to, to help you live, to keep you from being killed by the headaches, the gift. I hope that someday you will understand. I will always wait for you. I love you with all my heart. He nodded tearfully. If that's true, then find Zed. Tell him what you have done. Tell him. Sister Verna's voice broke in. Richard, take your things and go wait with the horses. Looking back at her, he nodded. He went to the far corner and picked up his cloak, bow, and pack. Reaching in, he pulled out the three leather thongs, the one with the birdman's whistle, the one with Scarlet's tooth, and the one with Denna's aegeel. As Kalin watched him hang the three of them around his neck, she wished she had something of her own to give him. She tried desperately to think of something. As he went past her, she put a hand to his arm and stopped him. Wait. Kalin pulled the knife from his belt. She held out a long lock of her hair and severed it with the knife. She didn't even think about what she was doing, what happened when confessors cut their own hair. With a scream of pain, she found herself on the ground. The magic seared through her, burning every nerve in its passing. She fought to remain conscious as she gulped for air. She struggled against the wrenching pain of it. She had to remain conscious, or Richard might leave before she could give it to him. She thought of only that and forced herself to her feet. As she did so, the pain finally abated. Still panting, Kaylin pulled a small blue ribbon from the waist of the dress, cut it too, and after wrapping the long strand of hair around two fingers, tied it together in the middle with the ribbon. As he watched, she returned the knife to its sheath at his belt and put the lock of hair in his shirt pocket. To remind you, always, that my heart is with you, that I love you. Expressionless, he looked at her a long moment. Find Zed, was all he said, before turning and going through the doorway. Kalin stood, staring at the door after he was gone. She felt numb, empty, lost. Sister Verna stopped next to her, watching the door with her. That was probably the most courageous act I have ever witnessed, she said softly. The people of the Midlands are fortunate to have you as their mother confessor. Kalin continued to stare at the door. He thinks I betrayed him. She turned and looked at the sister, tears welling up in her eyes. He thinks I betrayed him. The sister studied her face for a time. You have not? I promise you that in time I will help him to see the truth of what you have done this day. Please, she begged, don't hurt him. Sister Verna clasped her hands in front of herself and took a deep breath. You have just hurt him to save his life. Would you have me do any less? A tear ran down her cheek. I guess not, and I doubt you could do anything as cruel as what I have just done. Sister Verna nodded. I fear you are right, but I will give you my promise that I will personally watch over him and see to it that what is done is only what is necessary. I promise you that I will not let it go one inch beyond that, not one breath, on my word as a sister of the light. Thank you. She looked down at the knife in the other's hand. The sister pushed it back up her sleeve. You would have killed him. If he said no, you would have killed him. She nodded. If he had said no, the pain and madness at the end would have been grotesque. I would have spared him that. 
but it doesn't matter now. You have saved his life. Thank you, Mother Confessor. Kalen. Sister Verna stepped toward the door. Sister, how long? How long will you have him? How long will I have to wait? The sister didn't turn. I'm sorry I can't say. It takes as long as it takes. Much of it is up to him. It depends on how fast he learns. Kalen smiled for the first time. I think you will be surprised at how fast Richard learns. Sister Verna nodded. That is what I fear most. Knowledge before wisdom. It frightens me more than anything else. I think, too, that Richard's wisdom may surprise you. I pray you are right. Goodbye, Kalen. Don't try to follow, or he will die. Sister, one more thing. The cold danger in her own voice surprised her. If you are lying to me about any of it, if you kill him, I will hunt down every sister of the light. I will kill every last one, but not before each of you begs endlessly to die. The sister stood still as stone a moment before nodding and then going on her way. Kalen followed her out and stood with the people outside as she watched the sister mount her horse. Richard already sat tall on a big bay gelding. His back was to her as he waited. Kalen's heart was breaking. She wanted to see his face one more time, but he didn't turn as the two of them started away. Kalen sank to her knees. Richard, she cried, I love you. He seemed not to hear her as he and Sister Verna disappeared into the snowy grasslands. Kalen sat on the ground in her wedding dress, her head hanging down, crying. Wesselon put an arm around her, comforting her. Kalen remembered what he had said, find Zed. She forced herself to her feet. The elders were all there. She looked around at them all. I must leave at once. I must get to Aidendrill. I need some men to go with me, to help me, to be sure I make it. Savidlin came up next to her. I go, and as many of my hunters as you wish. All of them, if you wish. We will take a hundred. Kalin put a hand on his shoulder and gave him a little smile. No, I do not wish it to be you, my friend, or your hunters. I will take only three men. Everyone mumbled in confusion. More would bring attention, maybe trouble. It will be easier with three to slip unnoticed. It will take less time that way. Kalen took the hand away and pointed at a man who stood watching, glaring. I choose you, Chandelin. The two brothers were standing to his side. And you, Prindon and Tosidon. Chandelin stormed forward. Me? Why would you want me? Because I must not fail. I know that if I took Savidlin, he would try his hardest, but if he failed, the mud people would know he did his best. You are a better hunter of men. Richard told me once that if he had to pick one man to fight beside him, it would be you, even though you hate him. Where we go, men are the danger. If I don't make it, if you fail me, everyone will think it is because you didn't try your hardest. They will always think you let me die. Let another mud person die, because you hate me and Richard. If you let me be killed, you will never be welcomed back to the mud people, your people. Prindon stepped forward, his brother right next to him. I will go. My brother, too. We will help you. Chandelin glared. I will not. I will not go. Kalin looked to the bird man. His brown eyes met hers, and then he turned an iron gaze on Chandelin. Kalin is a mud person. You are the bravest, most cunning fighter among us. It is your responsibility to protect us, all of us. You will do this. You will go with her. You will follow her orders, and you will get her safely to where she wishes to go. Or you will leave now and never return. And Chandelin, if she is killed, don't come back. If you do, we will kill you as we would kill any outsider with black painted on his eyes. Chandelin shook with rage. He threw his spear on the ground. Seething, he put fists to his hips. If I am to leave our land, there will have to be a ceremony to call the spirits to protect us on our journey. It will take until tomorrow. We leave then. All eyes went to Kalin. I leave in one hour. You will be with me. You have until then to prepare. Kalin turned to the spirit house to change out of her wedding dress into her traveling clothes and to get her things together. She gratefully accepted Wesselon's offer to help. Chapter 18 
Fat, wet flakes of snow drifted down. Sometimes they fell harder, gathering in gusts and swirling into white curtains. Richard rode in a numb haze behind Sister Verna. The third horse was tethered to his and trotted along behind. When the snow swept down in dense flurries, the sister was no more than a gray shape ahead of him. It never occurred to him to wonder where they were going or to close his cloak against the cold, biting wind. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. His thoughts seemed to float and dance with the snow, unable to settle. He had never loved anything in his life the way he loved Kalen. She had become his life and she had sent him away. He hurt too much to think of anything else. He was stunned that she would doubt his love, that she would send him away. Why would she send him away? His mind drifted in and out of dense, desperate thoughts. He couldn't understand how she could ask him to put on a collar to prove his love. He had told her what wearing a collar meant to him. Maybe he should have told her all of it. Maybe then she would have understood. His chest ached where Dark and Rawl had burned him. When he reached up and touched the bandage, he finally noticed that the snow flurries had stopped. The low, scudding clouds were broken in places, letting shafts of sunlight shine through. The grassland was a flat, dead brown, and the clouds a dull, dead gray. The landscape was colorless, empty. By the angle of the sun, he realized it was getting to be late afternoon. They had been riding for a long time, in silence. Sister Verna had said nothing to him. He reached up and experimentally touched the collar for the first time. It was smooth, seamless, cold. He had said he would never wear a collar again. He had promised himself, yet here he was wearing one. Worse, he had put it on himself, put it on because Kalen had asked him to, because she doubted him. For the first time since he had put it on, he forced himself to think of something else. He couldn't think about Kalen anymore, couldn't stand the pain. He was the seeker. He had other things to think about, important things. With a gentle squeeze of his lower legs to the horse's girth, he urged it ahead, pulling it close beside the sister's chestnut gelding. Richard reached up to push back the hood of his cloak and realized it wasn't even up, so he ran his fingers through his wet hair instead. He looked over at Sister Verna. There are some things we have to talk about, important things you don't know about. She glanced over without emotion. The edge of her hood partially blocked her face. And what would those things be? I am the seeker. She looked away, returning her eyes to where they had been. That is hardly something I don't know. Her calm, unconcerned attitude annoyed him. I have responsibilities. I told you before. There are important things going on you know nothing about. Dangerous things. She didn't respond. It was as if he hadn't spoken. He decided to cut right to the heart of it. The Keeper is trying to escape the underworld. We do not speak his name. You are not to speak it as you have just done. It brings his attention. When we must speak of him, he is addressed as the Nameless One. She was talking to him as if he were a child. Kalen's life was in danger, and this woman was treating him like a child. I don't care what you call him. He's trying to get out, and I assure you I already have his attention. At last she looked over, unconcerned. The Nameless One is always trying to get out. Richard took a deep breath and tried again. The veil to the underworld is torn. He is going to get out. Sister Verna turned to him once more, this time pulling the edge of the hood back to get a better look. Curly brown hair peeked out the edge of the dark, heavy hood. She had an odd frown, a frown of amusement. There was a wisp of a smile at the corners of her mouth. The Creator himself put the Nameless One where he is. The Creator himself placed the veil with his own hand to keep him there. Her smile swelled a little as her eyebrows came closer together, creasing her weathered brow. The Nameless One cannot escape the prison the Creator has placed him in. Do not be afraid, child. Exploding in rage, Richard wheeled his bay mare around toward the sister. The two horses jostled, whinnying and tossing their heads. Richard firmly snatched the reins of the sister's surprised horse to keep it from rearing or bolting. He leaned toward her, his chest heaving in fury. I will not be called names. 
I will not have names put to me because I wear a collar. I am Richard, Richard Rawl. Sister Verna didn't flinch. Her voice remained calm and smooth. I'm sorry, Richard. It was only force of habit. I am used to dealing with ones much younger than you. I meant nothing demeaning by it. The way she stared at him made him feel suddenly foolish, embarrassed. Made him feel like a child. He released the reins. I apologize for yelling. I'm not in a very good mood. She frowned again. I thought your name was Cypher. He tugged his cloak over his chest where the bandage covered his burn. It's a long story. George Cypher raised me as his son. I only found out a short time ago that I am, in truth, the son of Dark and Rawl. Her frown deepened. Dark and Rawl? The one with the gift you killed? You killed your father? Don't look at me like that. You didn't know him. You have no idea what kind of man he was. He imprisoned and tortured and killed more people than you or I could imagine. The idea of him being with my mother makes me sick. But that is the truth of it. I am his son. If you expect me to be sorry I killed him, you will have longer than eternity to wait. Sister Verna shook her head with what seemed genuine concern. I'm sorry, Richard. Sometimes the Creator weaves a tangled cloth for our lives, and we are left to wonder why. But I am sure of one thing. He has reasons for what he does. Babble. He was getting babble from this woman. He urged his horse around and started out again. I'm telling you, the veil is torn and the keeper is going to get out. Her voice lowered dangerously. The nameless one. He glanced over, annoyed. Fine, the nameless one. I couldn't care less what you want to call him, but he is going to get out. We are all in great danger. Kalin was in great danger. He didn't care if this sorceress of a sister burned him to a cinder. His life meant nothing to him anymore. His only concern was Kalin's safety. Sister Verna's quizzical frown and smile returned. Who told you such a thing? Shota, a witch woman. She told me the veil was torn. He left out that Shota had also told him he was the one who had torn it. She said it was torn, and if it wasn't fixed, the key... The nameless one would escape. Sister Verna smiled. Her eyes sparkled. A witch woman, she laughed a little. And you believed her. You believed a witch woman. You think witch women speak the truth in such simple fashion? Fuming, Richard glanced at her from the corner of his eye. She seemed pretty sure of it to me. She wouldn't lie about something this important. I believe her. Sister Verna seemed to think the whole thing amusing. If you had ever had occasion to deal with a witch woman before, Richard, you would know that they have an odd view of the truth. They can be well-intentioned at times, but witch women speak in words that rarely come to pass the way they sound. The truth of that took some of the steam out of him. Sister Verna certainly seemed to know about witch women. In fact, she seemed to share his own view of them. She seemed pretty sure of what she was saying. She was afraid. I am sure she was. A wise person is always afraid of the nameless one. But I wouldn't put much stock in what she says. It's not just what she says. Other things have happened, too. She looked over curiously. Such as? A screeling. She set her calm brown eyes back ahead. A screeling. You have seen a screeling, yes? Seen it. It attacked me. Screelings are from the underworld. They are sent by the nameless one. It was sent through a tear in the veil to kill me. Her smile returned. You have quite an imagination, Richard. You have listened to too many children's songs. He restrained his renewed anger. What do you mean? Screelings are indeed from the underworld, as are other beasts. The heart hounds, for example. But they are not sent. They simply escape. We live in a world that lies between good and evil, between the light and the dark. The Creator did not intend this to be a perfect world safe from all harm. We cannot understand his reasons always, but he has them, and he is perfect. Perhaps the Screelings are meant to show us the dark side. I don't know. But I do know they are simply an evil that sometimes comes. I have seen this happen before to ones with the gift. It is possible that the gift draws them. A test, perhaps. A warning, perhaps, of the rancid evil that awaits those who stray from the light. But 
there are prophecies that say they are sent when the veil is torn, sent by the nameless one. How could that be, Richard? Has the veil ever been torn before? How should I know? He thought a minute. But I don't see how it could have been. If it were, how could it have been mended? And it wouldn't have gone unnoticed. What are you getting at? Well, if the veil has never been torn, how could the Screelings have been sent before? How would we know what they are? How could they have a name already put to them? It was Richard's turn to frown. Maybe we only know them as Screelings because they have been named in the prophecy. You have read this prophecy? Well, no. Kaylin told it to me. And she read it herself with her own eyes, yes? No. She learned it when she was young. Richard's irritated frown deepened. In a song, she learned it from wizards. In a song. Sister Verna didn't look over, but her smile widened. Richard, I do not mean to belittle your fears, but things repeated over and over, especially in a song, have a way of changing. As for prophecies, well, they are harder to understand than a witch woman. We have vaults full of them at the palace. As part of your studies, perhaps you will be allowed to work with them. I have read all of them we have, and I can tell you that they are beyond the minds of most. If you aren't cautious, you can find a prophecy that will say whatever you want to hear. Or at least, you will think it is what you want to hear. Some wizards devote their lives to the study of them, and yet even they understand only a tiny fraction of their truth. This is a danger not to be taken so lightly. Do you think the veil is torn that simply? Have faith, Richard. The Creator placed the veil. Have faith in Him. Richard rode in silence for a time. Sister Verna did seem to make sense. He felt as if his understanding of the world was tilting. But it was difficult for him to think too hard on the subject. Kalin kept creeping back into his mind. His anguish at her wanting him to put on a collar to prove his love, knowing it would take him from her, tore at his heart. The betrayal burned painfully in his chest. He picked at the reins with his thumbnail. At last, he turned once more to the sister. That's not all. I haven't told you the worst of it. She smiled a motherly smile. There is more? Tell me then. Perhaps I can put your fears to rest. Richard let out a deep breath, trying to release at least a little of the pain with it. The man I killed. Dark and Rall. My father. Well, when he died, he was sent to the underworld. To the key, the nameless one. Last night, he escaped. Escaped through the tear in the veil. He is back in this world. Back to tear the veil the rest of the way. And you know he was sent to the nameless one. You were in the underworld to see him arrive there, at the side of the nameless one, yes? The woman had a way of poking his temper awake. He tried to ignore the sting of the jab. I talked to him when he came back to this world. He told me. He told me he was here to tear the veil the rest of the way. He said the keeper would have us all. A dead man come back to this world. Do you see? The only way his spirit could be here is if he came through the veil. You were just sitting there, and this dead man walked up and spoke to you, yes? Richard frowned deeply at her, but she didn't look over to see it. It was at a gathering with the mud people. I was trying to talk to their ancestors' spirits, to try to find out how to close the veil, and he appeared. Ah, she nodded in satisfaction. I see. What does that mean? Sister Verna's face set into an expression of tolerance, born of explaining things to children. Did the mud people have you drink or eat some sacred potion before you saw this spirit? No. You simply sat down with them and saw spirits, yes? Well, not exactly. There is a banquet first, for a couple of days. The elders eat and drink special things, but I never did. Then we were painted with mud, and then I went into the spirit house with the seven elders. We sat in a circle, and they chanted a while. Then they passed around a basket, and we took out a spirit frog and rubbed the slime from its back onto our skin. Frogs, Sister Verna looked over. Red frogs, yes? Yes, red spirit frogs. With a smile, she looked back ahead. I know of them. And it made your skin tingle, yes? And it is then you saw spirits? 
That's a pretty simplistic version, but I guess you could distill it down like that. What are you trying to say? You have traveled the Midlands often. You have seen many of her peoples. No. I'm from Westland. I don't know much about the people of the Midlands. She nodded to herself again. There are many peoples in the Midlands, unbelievers, who do not know of the light of the Creator. They worship all sorts of things, idols and spirits and such. They are savages who hold to customs of worship centered around these false beliefs. They mostly have one thing in common. They use sacred food or drink to help them see their spirit protectors. She looked over to make sure he was paying attention. The mud people apparently use the substance on the red frogs to help them have these visions of what they wish to see. Visions? The Creator has placed many plants and animals in our world for us to use. The power of these things work in invisible ways. A tea, for example, of the bark of willow can help reduce a fever. We can't see it work, but we know it does. There are many things that if eaten will make us sick, even kill us. The Creator gave us minds to learn the difference. There are some things that if eaten, or in the case of the red frogs, rubbed into our skin, will make us see things, just as we see things when we dream. Savages who don't know better think the things they see are real. That is what happened to you. You rubbed the slime of a red frog into your skin, and it gave you visions. Your rightful fear of the Nameless One made it all the more real to you. If these spirits were real, why would you need to use some special plant or food or drink, or in this case, red frogs, to see and talk to them? Please don't think I am mocking you, Richard. The visions can seem very real. When you are under their influence, they can seem as real as anything, but they are not. Richard was reluctant to believe the sister's explanation, but he understood what she was talking about. From a young age, Zed had taken him into the woods to find special plants to help people, alm to take away pain and help minor wounds heal faster, and wattle root to ease the pain of deeper wounds. Zed had showed him other plants that would help fevers, digestion, the pain of childbirth, dizzy spells, and he had also told him about plants to avoid, plants that were dangerous, and plants that would make people see things that weren't there visions. But he didn't think he had imagined Dark and Rawl. He burned me. Richard tapped his shirt where the bandage was. I couldn't have been having visions. Dark and Rawl was there. He reached out and touched me, and it burned my skin. I'm not imagining that. The sister gave a little shrug. That could be one of two things. After you rubbed the frog on your skin, you couldn't see the room you were in, could you? No, it just seemed to disappear into a dark void. Well, see it or not, it was still there. And I'm sure the savages would have had a fire burning when you had this gathering. And when you were burned, you were not sitting in the same place, but you were standing, moving about, yes? Yes, he admitted reluctantly. She pursed her lips. In the deluded state you were in, you probably fell and burned yourself on a stick in the fire and imagined that it was this spirit doing the burning. Richard was beginning to feel decidedly foolish. Could the sister be right? Was it all this simple? Was he really this gullible? You said it could be two things. What is the other? The sister rode in silence for a moment. When her voice came, it came lower, darker than it had before. The nameless one always seeks to have a side with him. Though he is locked behind the veil, his tentacles can still reach into this world. He can still harm us. He is dangerous. The dark side is dangerous. When ignorant people dabble in things dark, they can call forth danger, call forth the attention of the Nameless One or his minions. It is possible you really were touched, burned by one of the evil ones. She glanced over. There are dangerous things people are too foolish to avoid. Sometimes those things can kill. Her voice brightened a bit. That is one of our jobs, trying to teach those who have not yet seen the light of the Creator to go toward that light and stay away from the things dark and dangerous. Richard couldn't think of anything to counter the sister's explanations of events. The things she said made sense. If she were right, that would mean that Kalin wasn't really in danger, that Kalin was safe. He wanted to believe that. He desperately wanted to believe that. But still, I will admit that you could be right but I'm not sure. There seems to be more to it than I can put into words. I understand, Richard. It's hard to admit we have been wrong. 
No one wants to admit they have been tricked or made to look the fool. That view of ourselves hurts, but part of growing, learning, is being able to hold the truth above all else, even when it means we must admit to having held foolish ideas. Please believe me, Richard, I do not see you as a fool for having believed as you did. Your fear was understandable. The mark of a wise person is being able to reach beyond for the truth, to admit they can learn more than they already know. But all of these things are connected, are they? A wise person doesn't string together the beads of unrelated events into a necklace simply to have something they wish to see. A wise person sees the truth, even if it is something unexpected. That is the most beautiful necklace to wear, the truth. The truth, he muttered to himself. He was the seeker. The truth was what the seeker was all about. It was woven in gold wire into the hilt of his sword, the sword of truth. Something about the things that had happened were more than he could put into words for her. Could it be as she said? Could he simply be fooling himself? He remembered the wizard's first rule. People will believe anything, either because they want it to be true or are afraid it might be. He knew from experience that he was as susceptible to it as anyone else. He wasn't above believing a lie. He had believed Kalin loved him. He had believed she would never do anything to hurt him, and she had sent him away. Richard felt the lump rising in his throat again. I'm telling you the truth, Richard. I am here to help you. He didn't answer. He didn't believe her. As if to answer his thoughts, she asked, How are your headaches? The question stunned him. Not the question so much as the realization. They're gone. The headache is completely gone. Sister Verna smiled and nodded in satisfaction. As I promised you, the Radha Han would take away the headache. We only want to help you, Richard. His eyes turned to watch her. You also said the caller is to control me. So we may teach you, Richard. You must have a person's attention to teach them. That's all it is for. And to hurt me. You said it is to give me pain. She shrugged, opening her palms to the sky, the reins woven through her fingers. I have just given you pain. I showed you how you were believing in something foolish. Does that not give you pain? Does it not hurt you to learn you have been wrong? But isn't it better to know the truth than to believe a lie, even if it hurts? He looked away, thinking of the truth of Kalin making him put on a collar, sending him away. The truth hurt more than anything. The truth that he wasn't good enough for her. I guess so. But I don't like wearing a collar, not one bit. He was sick of talking. His chest hurt. His muscles were all cramped. He was tired. He missed Kalin. But Kalin had made him put on a collar and sent him away. He let his horse and the one tethered to his saddle fall back to trail behind the sisters once more as tears ran down his cheeks, feeling like ice on his skin. He rode in silence. His horse tore off wads of grass and chewed as it plodded along. Ordinarily, Richard wouldn't have let his horse eat while it had a bit in its mouth. It couldn't chew properly with the bit and could end up with colic. You could lose a good horse to colic. Instead of stopping it, Richard stroked its warm neck and gave reassuring pats. It felt good to have company that didn't tell him he was stupid, company that didn't judge or make demands. He didn't feel like doing the same to the horse. Better to be a horse than a man, he thought. Walk, turn, stop, nothing more. Better to be anything than what he was. Despite what Sister Verna said, he knew he was nothing more than a captive. Nothing she said could change that. If he was ever going to be set free, he would have to learn to control the gift. Once the sisters were satisfied he could control the gift, maybe they would free him. If Kalin didn't want him, at least he would be free. That was what he would do, he decided. Learn to use the gift as fast as he could so he could get the collar off and be set free. Zed had always told him he was a fast learner. He would learn everything. Besides, he had always liked learning. He had always wanted to know more. There was never enough for him. He brightened the slightest bit at the idea. He liked learning new things. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad. He could do it. Besides, what else was there? He thought of the way Denna trained him, taught him. His mood sank. He was just deluding himself. They would never set him free. 
He wasn't going to learn because he wanted to, or what he wanted to. He was going to learn what the Sisters of the Light wanted him to learn, and he didn't necessarily believe that what they taught was the truth. They were going to teach him about pain. It was hopeless. He rode with his dark, brooding thoughts. He was the seeker, the bringer of death. Every time he killed someone with the sword of truth, he knew that that was what he was. That was what the seeker did, what the seeker was, the bringer of death. As the sky began flaming into pinks, yellows, and golds, he noticed white patches in the distance ahead. It wasn't snow. The snow hadn't stuck. Besides, these things moved. Sister Verna didn't say anything about them. She simply rode along. The sun at their backs sent long shadows ahead of them. For the first time, Richard realized they were traveling east. When they were closer, he recognized the white forms spread across their way, turning pink in the last rays of the sun. It was a small flock of sheep. As they passed among them, Richard saw that the people tending the animals were Bantak. He recognized their manner of dress. Three Bantak men approached to the side of Richard, ignoring Sister Verna. They mumbled something he didn't understand, but their words and faces seemed to hold a certain reverence. The three dropped to their knees and bowed down, stretching their arms out, their hands on the ground toward him. Richard slowed his horse to a walk as he looked down at them. They came back up on their knees, chattering at him, but he didn't understand the words. Richard lifted his hand in greeting. It seemed to satisfy them. The three broke into grins and bowed a few more times as he rode past. They came to their feet and trotted next to his horse, attempting to push things into his hands. Bread, fruit, strips of dried meat, a drab, dirty scarf, necklaces made of teeth, bone, and beads, even their shepherd's crooks. Richard forced a smile, and with signs he thought they would understand, tried to decline the offers without offending the men. One of the three was particularly insistent he take a melon, offering it repeatedly. Richard didn't want trouble, so he took the melon and bowed his head several times. They seemed proud, nodding and bowing as he rode on. He gave them a last bow from his saddle as he rode past and slipped the melon into a saddlebag. Sister Verna had her horse turned toward him, waiting for him to catch up. She scowled as she waited. Richard didn't hurry his horse along. He simply let it go at its own pace. What now, he wondered. When he finally reached her, she leaned toward him. Why are they saying those things? What things? I don't understand their language. She gritted her teeth. They think you are a wizard. Why would they think that? Why? Richard shrugged. I would guess it's because that's what I told them. What? She pushed the hood of her cloak back. You are not a wizard. You have no right telling them you are. You lied. Richard folded his wrists over the high pommel of the saddle. You're right. I'm not a wizard. Yes, I told them a lie. Lying is a crime against the Creator. Richard heaved a weary sigh. I did not do it to play at being a wizard. I did it to stop a war. It was the only way I could keep a lot of people from dying. It worked and no one was hurt. I would do the same thing again if it would prevent killing. Lying is wrong. The Creator hates lies. Does this Creator of yours like killing better? Sister Verna looked like she was ready to spit fire at him. He is everyone's creator, not just my creator, and he hates lies. Richard calmly appraised her heated expression. Tell you that himself, did he? Come right up and sit down next to you and say, Sister Verna, I want you to know I hate lies? She ground her teeth and growled the words. Of course not. It is written. Written in books. Ah, Richard nodded. Well, then, of course, it is the truth. If it is written in books, then it has to be true. Everyone knows that if something is written down and attributed, that it must be true. Her eyes were fire. You treat lightly the Creator's words. He leaned toward her, some of his own heat surfacing. And you, Sister Verna, treat lightly the lives of people you consider heathens. She paused, and with an effort calmed herself a little. Richard, you must learn that lying is wrong, very wrong. It is against the Creator against what we teach. You are as much a wizard as an infant is an old man. Calling yourself a wizard when you are not is a lie, a filthy lie. It is a desecration. You are not a wizard. Sister Verna, I know very well that lying is wrong. 
I am not in the habit of going around telling lies. But in perspective, I consider it preferable to people being killed. It was the only way. She took a deep breath and nodded, causing the curls in her brown hair to spring up and down a little. Perhaps you are right, so long as you know that lying is wrong. Don't make a habit of it. You are no wizard. Richard stared at her as his grip tightened on the reins. I know I'm not a wizard, Sister Verna. I know exactly what I am. He gave his horse's ribs a squeeze with his legs, urging it ahead. I'm the bringer of death. Her hand darted out and snatched a fistful of his shirt sleeve, yanking him around in his saddle. He snugged the reins back as he was pulled around to her wide eyes. Her voice was an urgent whisper. What did you say? What did you call yourself? He gave her an even look. I'm the bringer of death. Who named you that? Richard studied her ashen face. I know what wearing this sword means. I know what it is to draw it. I know it better than any seeker before me has known. It is part of me, I am part of it. I used its magic to kill the last person who put a collar around my neck. I know what it makes me. I lied to the Bantak because I didn't want people to be killed, but there is another reason. The Bantak are a peaceful people. I did not want them to learn the horror of what it means to kill. I know all too well that lesson. You killed Sister Elizabeth, perhaps you know too. Who named you bringer of death, she pressed. No one. I named myself, because that is what I do, what I am. I am the bringer of death. She released her grip on his shirt. I see. As she began turning her horse around, he called out her name in a commanding tone. It brought her to a halt. Why? Why do you want to know who named me that? Why is it so important? Her anger seemed to have vanished and left a shadow of fear in its passing. I told you I read all the prophecies at the palace. There is a fragment of one that contains those words. He is the bringer of death, and he shall so name himself. Richard narrowed his eyes. And what does the rest of the prophecy say? Did it also say that I will kill you and anyone else I have to to get this collar off? She looked away from his glare. Prophecies are not for the eyes or ears of the untrained. With a sharp kick, she surprised her horse and sent it surging ahead. As he followed behind, Richard decided to let the matter drop. He didn't care about prophecies. They were nothing more than riddles as far as he was concerned, and he hated riddles. If something was important enough to need saying, why couch it in riddles? Riddles were stupid games and not important. As he rode, he wondered how many people he was going to have to kill to get the collar off. One or a hundred, it didn't matter. His rage boiled at the thought of being led around by the Radha Han. He gritted his teeth at the thought. His jaw muscles flexed at the thought. His fists tightened on the reins. Bringer of death. He would kill as many as it took. He would have the collar off or he would die trying. The fury, the need to kill, surged through every fiber of his being. With the start, he realized he was calling forth the magic from the sword, even as it sat in its scabbard. He no longer had to hold the sword to do it. He could feel its wrath tingling through him. With an effort, he put it down and calmed himself. Besides the rage of hate from the sword, he also knew how to call forth its opposite side, its white magic. The sisters didn't know he could do that. He hoped he would have no reason to teach them. But if he had to, he would. He would have the collar off. He would use either side of the sword's magic or both to have the collar off his neck. When the time came, when the time came. In the violet afterglow of twilight, Sister Verna brought them to a halt for the night. She had said nothing further to him. He didn't know if she was still angry, but he didn't really care. Richard walked the horses a short distance to a line of small willows at the bank of a creek and removed their bridles, replacing them with halters. His bay tossed her head, glad to have the bit out of her mouth. Richard saw it was an aggressive spade bit. Few bits were more cruelly punishing. People who used them, it seemed to him, were people who thought horses were nothing more than beasts humans had to conquer and control. He thought maybe they should have to have a bit in their mouths to see how they liked it. Properly trained, a horse needed nothing more than a jointed snaffle. If it was properly trained and given a little understanding, it didn't even need a bit. 
he guessed some people preferred punishment to patience. He reached up experimentally to stroke the horse's black-tipped ear. It lifted its head firmly away from his hand. So, he muttered, they like to twitch your ear, too. He scratched and patted the horse's neck. I won't do that to you, my friend. The horse leaned against his scratching. Richard retrieved water in a canvas bucket and let each horse have only a few swallows, as they weren't cooled down. In one of the saddlebags, he found brushes and took his time carefully currying each of them and then picking their hooves clean. He took longer than he needed to because he preferred their company to the sisters. After he finished, he cut a section of rind from the melon the Bantak had given him and gave each horse a piece. Horses loved few things in life as much as a melon rind. Each showed eagerness for the treat. It was the first eagerness any of them had shown. After seeing the spade bits, he knew why. When he decided his chest hurt too much to stand around any longer, he went over to where Sister Verna sat on a small blanket and put his own blanket on the ground opposite her. He folded his legs as he sat and pulled a piece of the flat tava bread from his pack, more for something to do than because he was hungry. She accepted his offer of a piece. He cut up the melon and put the remaining rind aside, saving it for later. Richard offered Sister Verna a piece of melon. She looked at it coolly as he held it out. It was given under false pretenses. It was given as thanks for preventing a war. She took it at last, but not eagerly. Perhaps. I'll take first watch, if you wish, he offered. There is no need to stand watch. He appraised her in the near darkness as he chewed a juicy piece of melon. There are heart hounds in the Midlands, other things too. I could draw another screeling. I think a watch would be wise. She pulled off a piece of tava bread without looking up. You are safe with me. There is no need for a watch. Her voice was flat. It wasn't angry, but it wasn't far from it either. He ate in silence for a while and then decided to try to lighten the mood. He tried to make his voice sound cheerful, even though he felt no cheer. I'm here, you're here, I'm wearing the Radahan. How about if you start teaching me to use the gift? She looked up from under her eyebrows as she chewed. There will be time enough to teach you when we reach the Palace of the Prophets. The air felt as if it had suddenly cooled. His anger heated. The sword's anger tugged at him to be released. Richard put it down. As you wish. Sister Verna lay down on her blanket, pulling her cloak tightly around herself. It's cold. Build a fire. He put the last bite of tava bread in his mouth and waited until he had swallowed before speaking softly. Her eyes watched him. I'm surprised you don't know more about magic, Sister Verna. There is a word that is magic. It can accomplish more than you might think. Maybe you have heard it before. It is the word please. He rose to his feet. I'm not cold. If you want a fire, build it yourself. I'm going to go stand watch. I told you before, I will take nothing on faith. If we are killed in the night, it won't be without warning on my watch. He turned his back to her without waiting for a response. He didn't want to hear anything she had to say. Walking off a good distance through the dry grass, he found a mound of dirt around a groundhog hole and flopped down on top of it to watch, to think. The moon was up. It stared down at him and cast a pale silver light upon the surrounding empty land, enough light to enable him to see without any trouble. He looked out over the deserted countryside, brooding. As much as he tried to think of other things, it did no good. He could think of only one thing, Kalin. He drew up his knees and wrapped his arms around them after he had wiped some tears from his face. He wondered what she was doing, where she was, whether she would get Zed. He wondered if she still cared for him enough to go get Zed. The moon moved slowly across the sky as it stared down on him. What was he going to do? He felt lost. He pictured Kalin's face in his mind. He would have conquered the world to see her smile at him, to bask in the warmth of her love. Richard studied her face in his mind. He pictured her green eyes, her long hair, her beautiful hair. At that thought, he remembered the lock of her hair she had put in his pocket. He pulled it out and looked at it in the moonlight. It was a circle she had pulled together and tied in the middle with the ribbon from her wedding dress so that it reminded him of a figure eight turned sideways as he held it in his fingers. Turned sideways like that, 
It was also the symbol for infinity. Richard rolled the lock of hair between his finger and thumb, watching it as it spun. Kaylin had given it to him to remember her by, something to remember her by, because he would never see her again. Racking grief choked his breathing. He gripped the Aegeal as hard as he could until his fist shook with the effort. The pain from the Aegeal and his heartache twisted together into burning agony. He let it distort his perception until he could stand it no longer, and then he let it go on longer yet, let it go on until he collapsed to the base of the dirt mound, barely conscious. He gasped for air. The pain had swept all the thoughts from his mind. If only for a few minutes, his mind had been free of the anguish. He lay on the ground a long time, recovering. When he was finally able to sit up once more, he found the lock of hair still in his hand. He stared at it in the moonlight, remembering what Sister Verna had said to him, that he had told the Bantak a lie, a filthy lie. Those had been Kalin's words. She had said that his love for her was a filthy lie. Those words hurt more than the Aegeal. It's not a lie, he whispered. I would do anything for you, Kalin. But it wasn't good enough. Putting on the collar wasn't good enough. He wasn't good enough. Son of a monster. He knew what she wanted, what she really wanted. She wanted to be free of him. She wanted him to put on the collar so he would be taken away, so she would be free. I would do anything for you, Kalin, he cried. He stood up and looked out over the empty grassland. The dark horizon wavered in a watery blur. Anything, even this. I set you free, my love. Richard threw the lock of Kalin's hair as far as he could out into the night. He sank to his knees and fell face first to the ground, sobbing. He cried until he could cry no more. He continued to lie on the cold ground, groaning in agony until he realized he was gripping the Aegeal again. He let it go and at last sat up, flopping back in exhaustion against the dirt mound. It was over. Finished. He felt empty, dead. After a time, he rose to his feet. He stood a moment and then slowly drew the sword of truth. Its ring was a soft song in the cold air. The anger came out with the steel, and he let it fill the void in him, rage freely through him. He welcomed the anger into himself, letting it fill him until he was submerged in its wrath. His chest heaved with lethal need. His eyes glided to where the sister lay sleeping. He could see the dark hump of her body as he approached silently. He was a woods guide. He knew how to stalk silently. He was good at it. His eyes carefully watched the ground as he moved fluidly, watched the sleeping form of Sister Verna as he closed the distance. He didn't hurry. There was no need to hurry. He had as much time as he needed. He tried to slow his breathing to keep from making noise. He was nearly panting with all-consuming fury. The thought of wearing a collar again fed the raging fire within him, fueled the inferno. Rage from the sword's magic seared through him like molten metal. Richard recognized the feeling all too well and gave himself over to it. He was beyond reason, beyond being stopped. Nothing short of blood would now satisfy the bringer of death. His knuckles were white on the hilt, his muscles knotted with restrained need, aching to be set free, but they wouldn't be restrained for long. The magic of the sword of truth screamed to do his bidding. Richard stood, a silent shadow over Sister Verna looking down at her. The fury pounded in his head. He drew the sword along the inside of his forearm, wiping both sides in the blood, giving the steel a taste of it. The dark stain ran down the fuller, dripping from the tip. It ran wet and warm down his arm. His chest heaved as he gripped the hilt in both hands again. He felt the weight of the collar around his neck. The blade rose, glinting in the moonlight. He watched the sleeping sister at his feet. She was drawn up almost into a ball. She was cold, and she shivered as she slept. He stood with the blade raised, watched her as he gritted his teeth and shook with raging need. Kalin didn't want him, son of a monster. No, just monster. He saw himself standing over the sleeping woman, his sword in the air, ready to kill. He was the monster. That was what Kalin saw, 
and she had sent him away in a collar to be tortured because he was a monster that needed to be collared, a beast. Tears ran down his face. The sword slowly sank until the tip touched the ground. He stood staring at the sister as she slept, shivering with the cold. He stood a long time watching. Richard finally slid the sword quietly back into its scabbard. He retrieved his blanket and laid it over Sister Verna, tucking it carefully around her, being gentle so as not to wake her. He sat and watched until she stopped shivering, and then he lay down, wrapping himself in his cloak. He was exhausted, and he hurt all over, but he couldn't sleep. He knew they were going to hurt him. That was what the collar was for. When she got him to the palace, they were going to hurt him. What difference did it make? Memories danced and darted through his mind, memories of what Denna had done to him. He remembered the pain, the helpless agony, the blood, his blood. The visions went on and on. As long as he lived, he would never be able to forget them. It had only just ended, and now it was going to start all over again. There would never be an end to it. There was only one thought in all the turmoil of his mind that comforted him. He had learned from Sister Verna that he was wrong about the Keeper escaping. That meant Kalin was safe. She was safe, and that was all that really mattered. He tried to keep everything else away and think only of that. That thought allowed him to drift at last into sleep. Chapter 19 His eyes opened. The sun was just breaking the horizon. When he sat up, the pain from his burn caught his breath short. He put his hand over his shirt where the bandage was and held it there until that pain subsided. The residual effects of the Aegeal left the rest of him feeling as if he had been beaten with a club. He ached everywhere. He remembered from the time when Denna had trained him using the Aegeal, feeling a lot worse when he awoke only to have her start using the Aegeal on him all over again. Sister Verna was sitting on her blanket, her legs folded beneath her, watching him as she chewed something. She had her cloak around her shoulders with the hood down. Her curly brown hair looked freshly brushed. She had neatly folded Richard's blanket and placed it back next to where he slept. She said nothing about it. Richard pushed himself to his feet, taking a moment to steady himself and stretch his hurting, cramped muscles. The sky was a clear, cold, deep blue. The grass smelled sweet and damp with dew. The vapor of his breath drifted lazily in the still, crisp air. I'll go saddle the horses and we can be on our way. Don't you want something to eat? He shook his head. I'm not hungry. What happened to your arm? She asked without looking up. There was dark, dried blood all down his arm and hand. I was polishing my sword. It was dark. I cut myself. It's nothing. I see. She glanced up as he scratched the stubble on his face. I hope you are more careful when you shave your neck. Richard decided in that instant that as long as he was held captive in a collar, he would not shave. It would be his way of proclaiming to them that a collar was unjust, that he knew he was nothing more than their prisoner, and that he would not believe their spurious protestations to the contrary. There could be no justification for a collar, and there would be no compromising of that basic truth. None. Not ever. Richard glowered at the sister. Prisoners don't shave. He turned toward the horses. Richard! He looked over his shoulder. Sit down. Her voice was gentle, but he glared at the order nonetheless. She gestured to a place in front of her. Sit down. I was thinking about what you said. You are here. I am here. Sit down, and I will begin teaching you how to control the gift. He was caught off guard. Now? Here? Yes. Come and sit. He didn't really care about using the gift. He hated magic. He had only asked about it before because he had been trying to ease the tension. His eyes darted about before he finally sat and folded his legs, imitating the way she was sitting. What do you want me to do? There is much to teach you about using the gift. You will learn about balance in all things, especially magic. You must heed all our warnings and follow what we tell you. There are dangers to using magic. Perhaps you already know this from using the Sword of Truth, yes? Richard didn't move. She went on. There is greater danger in using the gift. It can have unanticipated results, results that can be disastrous. I have already used the gift. You said I used it in three specific ways. She leaned forward a little. And look what happened. It brought an unanticipated result. 
It resulted in you having that collar around your neck. Surprised, Richard stared at her. That wasn't a result of my using the gift. You were already looking for me. You said so. If I hadn't used the gift, the result would have been the same. Sister Verna slowly shook her head. Her eyes stayed on his. We had been looking for you for years. Something hid you from us. If you hadn't used the gift in the ways you did, I doubt we ever would have found you. Using the gift put that collar around your neck. Years. They had been searching for him for years. All that time he had lived peaceably in Westland. First with his brother and father and Zed, and then on his own as a woods guide. They had been looking for him, and he never knew it. The thought gave him a chill. He brought it on himself by using magic. He hated magic. 